Good morning, everybody. Welcome um, to day two of the Pocono rezoning hearings. What I thought we should do, this looks like there's some new people in the room. We'll just very briefly do a round of introductions, starting with the panel. Um, and then if, if you are introducing yourself and there's anything of a procedural nature that you wish to raise, do that at the same time. Uh, I'll start with myself, which I think should be well known by now. Phil Mitchell, I'm chairing the Hearings Independent Hearings Commissioner. Uh, good morning, uh, Janet Gibb, um, current councillor of the Waikato District Council and Independent Commissioner. Morning, Don Fulton. I'm Independent Commissioner, but former Waikato District Councillor. Good morning, Morena. I'm Jan Sedgwick. I'm a current Waikato District Councillor and appointed as an Independent Commissioner. Tēnā koutou, I'm Linda Te Aho, and I'm an Independent Commissioner. Um, Paul Cooney, uh, Deputy Chair, uh, Independent Commissioner and Lawyer. If we could just thank you, got thank you to the panel. Could we just go around the rest of the room briefly, please? Good morning, Chairman and uh, members of the panel. Uh, Bill Birch, representing the Hopkins family at, uh, at this session. Thank you. Good morning, panel, and Peter Fuller representing Pocono West, CSL and Top End, following on from Bill. Yep, thank you both. Yeah. David Mead here, um, the uh, consultant planner for the council on the 42A report and planner. Yeah, good morning, Mr. Mead. Thank you. Good morning, Sarah Mitchell here for Heinz. Thank you. Morning. Yeah. yeah. Uh, good morning. It's Sue Simons here on behalf of Pocono Village Holdings um, with Kate Stora. Thank you, Ms. Simons. Welcome. We've got a couple more people here that um, we've got T Singh 001. Apologies, we're just having a few technical difficulties. My name is Taljeet Singh Sandhu. I'm a strategic planning, a strategic planner with Waikato District Council, and I'm here with Jay McCartney. Thank you very much. We're just observing. Thank you. Thank you. It's going to be a long day if people um, don't turn their microphones on and introduce themselves. Nick's just sent me a message saying he's got yeah, no audio. No audio. Just wanting to listen in and observe. Do we know who that is, just as a matter of who's Nick? Might be Nick Rala from yesterday, but I'm unsure. If he could just send a note through so that we know who he is, that would be good. Would be appreciated, guys, if you could introduce yourselves if you're online um, instead of just sitting there. It's Mr. Ryan, Vicky. Chris Ryan uh, on behalf of Heinz Pipe Systems as well. Thank you. Could Vicky please let us know who, who it is, please? Technical difficult difficulties from Singapore listening in for Hopkins. Thank you. And we've got Mr. Gauntlet from the council observing. So right, let's let's move on. Um, and I think Sir William, we're starting with you on behalf of the Hopkins. Yes, thank you, um, thank you, Chairman. Um, uh, just the uh, reverting to the highlights of my evidence. The Key factor with the Hopkins property is that it is a, a, a small property at the fringe of Pocono. Um, the, uh, the, the hard edge of Pocono is essentially the motorway and um, 
uh, and Pioneer Road, and they are an island in between. Um, the opportunity is to uh, utilize a property which really has got no productive value. It's a um, essentially a, life, a large lifestyle block, but it does actually contain uh, quite a high, high level of biodiversity. Uh, and our proposal is to uh, protect that biodiversity and to use the environmental planning provisions uh, in, in the, um, uh, in the um, Waikato District Plan in the same way as is now being proposed by Havelock Village in terms of the, um, the low density uh, area which protects the biodiversity and has cluster development at a low scale. Uh, we see that as the future and the opportunity to provide an attractive soft edge uh, for Pocono. Um, as you can see from the map on the screen, the nearest neighbour is in fact um, the industrial area of Hines uh, and what is proposed there is a uh, an environmental area which to be planted, um, which adjoins Pioneer Road. And our suggestion is to continue that, um, that planting to protect the biodiversity on the Hopkins property, plus amenity planting around the, um, the motorway uh, and along Pioneer Road, just to make an attractive soft edge to the uh, Pocono urban area. Uh, we see that as the, uh, the best long-term use of this property and it's, we see it as an opportunity to enhance um, Pocono and provide uh, a, a, a level of cluster housing to, to support the demand for housing in Pocono. That's all you wanted to say? Yeah, that's something. Um, well, you asked for highlights and that's the... Oh, no, uh, that's, that's fine. I just didn't want you to um, feel shortchanged, that's all. But that's fine. I think we understand that and the the um, plan attached to your evidence, your, your rebuttal, I, I, rebuttal I suppose, statement is pretty clear. I suppose, yeah, I suppose the other factor, uh, Chairman, is that um, the Havelock Village development, uh, as uh, recommended by David Mead, um, does in fact provide a sort of a similar edge to Pocono as what we're proposing. And the, the Havelock Village development also provides an alternative route from Pioneer Road and for the people on Pioneer Road, including the Hopkins, uh, direct into, Pione into Pocono Village without going on the motorway and thus avoids the rather dangerous intersection between Pioneer Road and the motorway. So this complements what is recommended for Havelock Village. Um, and it sort of builds on the, the, the environmental planting and planning uh, at the edge of the industrial area. Uh, and we think it would enhance the, this whole area of Pocono and provide a, uh, a nice edge to the urban area. All right, very good, thank you. Let's see if there's any questions. Mr. Fulton? Yeah, just one, the, the, um, all the planting and the mitigating measures that you're just referring to yeah. would have to be done before the subdivision could take place. Is that what you're telling us? That yeah, the... absolutely, yeah. In, in my highlights package, I did uh, submit some uh, photos of the, the gully areas and the wetlands that um, uh, run through the Hopkins property. Um, and really this is an opportunity to protect those and to plant those up. Uh, I agree with David Meads that some of the planting is, is amenity planting rather than uh, for the protection of biodiversity, but with, with a combination of amenity planting, screening the motorway and Pioneer Road, plus the protection of the biodiversity, uh, I think it would be an excellent outcome for Pocono. Yeah, just looking at your photos, it looks to be as a, a substantial amount of work would be required, wouldn't it, in, in that planting? It's a, it's a very large area to 
to plant to mitigate along the expressway and and also um, into Heinz's area and so on. Yeah, that, that, that is correct, but with the, these environmental protection areas, uh, that's true. True in all cases, you know, they do involve a substantial amount of planting and protection of of the the planting areas. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yahoo. Um, kia ora kōrua. Uh, yesterday we heard a lot of um, evidence and submissions around reverse sensitivity, um, in particular in relation to the Heinz property and what they may want to do in the future. Um, I'm not sure if you were uh, you're aware of all of those submissions, but what what are your what would you say to um, those extensive submissions on reverse sensitivity and how that would impact not well, this this one of your clients and, and others later. Yeah, I am familiar with the um, debate about uh, reverse sensitivity and the <coughs> these the uh, suggestions in respect to those. I don't think that reverse sensitivity in this case will be an issue, um, largely because of the, the the extensive area that's now being uh, proposed to be planted by Heinz. That is a very large area which separates the Hopkins property from the Heinz industrial um, uh, plants that exist today and also their proposed expansion um, towards that environmental planting area. But there is, there is a, a, a large gap. In fact, I think what's proposed for the Hopkins will, would it build on what's now proposed by Heinz in terms of their environmental planting, it will continue that across Pioneer Road and will add to the uh, buffer um, between the industrial uh, noise that's generated. Uh, and I don't see any line of sight difficulties. I mean, the houses on, um, uh, on this property of the Hopkins can easily be oriented towards the east uh, overlooking those extensive wetlands across the other side of the motorway. Um, and I don't see, uh, I think they've distanced enough to be uh, well beyond the 55 decibel acoustic contour. So I don't see noise being a problem. And I don't see dust being a problem either. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Sedgwick? Uh, no, I have no questions. Thank you. Ms. Gibb? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, just wondering about where you talked about noise and dust. I may have missed the light. So what's your opinion about the light? Do you think that it would be not an issue or do you, what do you think about the lighting? That There's been quite extensive photographs. Yeah. I, well, I agree with um, David Mead's comments in his 42A report about, um, about that. I think there's, there'll be lots of opportunity on these properties to orient their houses to avoid light being a nuisance. I mean, the, the way that the, the houses are designed, in addition, in addition to that, you're going to have a lot of planting between this property and the Heinz property. I mean, we would prefer Heinz not to expand onto the proposed zone that they're talking about, but we do support the planting that Heinz are proposing. Um, we, we think Heinz are being a, a little bit uh, uh, unnecessarily aggressive in terms of their insistence on reverse sensitivity issues. I think they, those issues can be dealt with, but we would certainly prefer Heinz not to actually expand into the gully area that they propose. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Cooney? Uh, yes, thank you, um, Sir William. Um, what, what is the size of this property? Oh, good question. I thought you might ask that. I don't have it in front of me, but um, uh, James, can you provide that? It's, uh, it's, a, it's a relatively, it's, it's in the area of about eight hectares, I think, from memory. And um, what, what's it currently used for? Um, it's, it's underutilised, but there is stock grazing on it. Yeah, and there's a there's a house on it, res a dwelling. Yeah, there's a resident dwelling on it, and there's uh, some stock on it. Um, yeah. 
quite a lot of the quarter. The land is of the land is quite steep, and that's yeah. proposed to be planted. There's there's substantial um, wetlands through the property, and those those are proposed to be planted. Uh, and there are uh, several small clusters um, proposed of, of residential buildings, um, and that that would be dealt with through the EPA provisions and the uh, proposed district plan. What sort of legal protection would you um, be able to give to ensure the um, maintenance of, of those protection areas or planting areas? We would we would apply the normal uh, covenants between the district council and the property owners that they'd be required to maintain stock proof fences, pest control, and weed control uh, over the planted areas. Mm. Okay, th thank you. Just one for me, Sir William. Mr. Mead, when he was evaluating uh, this proposal, said he had concerns about residential creep. Um, and I think by that he means that this was almost a, a, a spot zoning. That, that I'm using that word colloquially rather than forensically. Do you have any comment on that? Well, much of what um, David Lee says I agree with, but that I don't agree with. Um, I mean, this, this is essentially a, a fringe of the edge of Pocono urban area. It's very similar to the, the uh, stance adopted by Havelock Village with their environmental protection area, where they see that as being a, a link to the river. Well, this provides a soft edge to the motorway. The motorway is the hard edge of urban Pocono. This is inside that uh, and would provide a softer edge to the, uh, to the urban area. I mean, as you come down the motorway, whether you're traveling north or south, you would see this environmental planted area, um, the houses that would be clustered on the area. Um, probably uh, there'd be about four groups of uh, four or three or four houses. Uh, they would largely be screened by the amenity planting. Uh, and what you'd have is a nice soft edge to the Pocono urban area as you view it from the motorway. So I don't, I don't think it's uh, sort of urban creep because it is, it is actually sort of inside the, the hard edge of the Pocono village already. What about the, the movement sort of southwest back sort of along the backside of Havelock across the other side of Pioneer Road? Yeah, well, I, I think Havelock village is providing a, a, an elegant solution to the isolation that the people in Bluff Road uh, suffer at the moment. For them to get to Pocono at the moment, they've got to go on the motorway. And they, they and go through that rather nasty pioneer motorway um, interchange. Uh, the, the Havelock development is going to provide alternative uh, links to the Pocono uh, village urban areas and the facilities of Pocono. Uh, and that's going to be of great value to not only uh, the Hopkins property, but to the people in Bluff Road as well. All right. Thank you very much, Sir William. Thanks for your evidence and your presentation today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Mr Fuller. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, can you hear me OK? Yes, we can. Thanks. So we do have quite a lineup today, and we are obviously addressing two different groups of clients, um, Pocono West and CSL and Top End. Subject to what the panel um, considers the most appropriate, but at least in my legal submissions, I suggest that I address effectively the matters across both, um, rather than separating them out throughout the day, and other witnesses may do that as well, and then particularly address the one outstanding issue with the recommendation report for CSL in terms of the countryside living. And maybe the other witnesses could also follow that format if that's agreeable to the panel, rather than effectively running two different cases today. We're happy to uh, accommodate whatever way you think best presents your case. I mean, it's your case or cases. So we're happy either way, whatever works for you. Thank you. Well, I think we'll um, 
basically address the matters that are common to both and deal with both at the same time. Um, also, is it acceptable to the panel if once a witness has presented their evidence and answered questions that they may leave and potentially be available if there was any further questions later in the day by Zoom? By yeah, that's, absolute, that's absolutely fine. Thank, thank you for that, Mr Chair. So dealing with some of the main issues that are in the threads that I understood from the hearing yesterday, um, I suppose one of the biggest things that we're all tackling here is just how we manage growth and what level of growth we're actually trying to provide for. Um, I think it's important, obviously, that the NPS is given effect to. In my submissions, and I've covered that in some um, detail, my submission is that the NPS is actually suggesting it's a bottom line approach, not a target in the sense that the 10 years for medium term, for example, for residential, is in fact a, a, an absolute minimum. It's not that we try and nickel and dime every particular house as if in year nine and 363 days or whatever, we use the last site. <laughs> That's not how land markets work. It's a minimum standard. And <clears throat> while we actually generally very much support Mr. Mead's recommendations, um, in my submission, the NPS has actually got a slightly different expectation than the one that he interpreted, which is to try and allocate growth in a very sort of um, refined way as if it's a target. So that's the first point I'd like to make about that. And, and certainly, uh, Mr. Thompson, and I think the council witness is of the view that um, it is a minimum and it's a bit of a estimate at best of times, and therefore, if there's any doubt, we should err on the oversupply rather than the undersupply. Just, just a point, I think the panel's already picked up in the previous decision on Ohiniwai. Um, the Waikato Regional Policy Statement, obviously a, an important document that has to be given effect to, but predates the latest NPS, so more weight on the NPS. Also, the 2017 strategy is only in its first stage uh, the growth strategy, and as I pointed out, um, I think in paragraph 50 of my submissions, the, the second phase is actually to um, take into account the um, NPS in, in the future-proof strategy. So I think that the panel, um, if it's not already aware, needs to be very mindful that that strategy can be taken into account, but it shouldn't overly be, re be relied on because it's actually going currently for a second phase, which is actually to take properly into account um, the NPS. Um, so that was sort of jumping into um, some of the meta growth issue. Now, just to ensure the panel, I, I think you're familiar from the site, um, the sites that um, are at question here based on Mr. Mead's presentation yesterday, and this is his figure five. But yes, Area 20 is commonly called the Munro block. And that was in fact notified with the plan change for residential zoning. So we're very much supportive of the council position on that. Um, in terms of medium density, which has been proposed, we are relaxed about that. We are positive about medium density. But we do also see and take on board Mr. Mead's point that maybe it's a bit premature in the sense that more work could be done. And if medium density can be achieved through the standard rules, but by application with criteria, we would be happy with that. Now, initially it all focused on the Munro block, but then the owners were encouraged, I think, to work with the Munro block, as I've indicated in my submissions, and this is where Bill knows the history that those owners were also interested in development and the council in fact suggested, well, why don't these groups of owners work together? So that's what's happened. And I think it's been said yesterday and we totally support that, that it is very appropriate that these blocks are treated in an integrated manner, uh, part of the same catchment and more work was done in response to some questions Mr. Mead had about things like road connectivity between the two blocks and we've provided plans to the council, which in our view demonstrate that these blocks can be developed um, sufficiently and, and well together in an integrated way. 
Now, one question also, I suppose, at the big picture level that was apparent to me yesterday was um, structure planning. How much, when, <laughs> timing um, has sufficient been done? Now, our first point to make on that is that this area 20 and 21 is not like some areas where there was very light submissions with respect to other owners and detail and technical work in the original submission supporting the applications. The panel will be aware, I think, from the evidence that Construct did a master plan for the Munro block that's been integrated across into CSL and top end. And for all intents and purposes, if you look at um, schedule or appendix one to the, to the RPS in Auckland, um, if that's to be used as a template, I appreciate it's across the boundary. And you went through and you looked at all of the criteria for a structure plan in my submission that has been achieved for these two blocks. It may not be the case for other areas. Um, there has been questions, for example, about Pocono East and in infrastructure and integration across State Highway 1. Um, that may be a different position. Those aren't my clients, um, so I'm not gonna say too much more about that, but there have been questions raised. But for example, when Wes Edwards um, has raised issues in a traffic sense in our submission, that doesn't really apply to Pocono West because the roading pattern as per the evidence of Leo Hills works and upgrades in the future, future modeling will be required as, as per normal once the residential zones are known and once they've been determined. So um, those two areas now, the, the one area that um, maybe just to focus on is maybe if James, can you bring up the plan with the 100 RL? Yes. Yep. Oh, sorry. Need the mouse back. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, we're driving things at the end. Hopefully, okay. We have for the. I, I, I note from the hearing yesterday, the panel was interested in where the hundred RL line actually intersects with the landform in the Havelock case, and we've gone ahead overnight and brought up a plan. So that's effectively the CSL and top end land, and. For the panel's benefit, um, that's where the 100 RL, that green line, intersects across those two blocks. So, as the panel will be aware, the main and only real point of disagreement with Mr. Mead's um, recommendations is that he was not agreeing to the countryside living um, on the CSL block to the left. Could you just point out the CSL block, James, for us with the. Yes. Yeah. And top end, yeah. So top end's that small block up in the front there and the CSL owns the rest of the land. Just ignore that medium density and um, neighborhood center for now, um, still on that plan. But, but that shows the 100 hour line for the benefit of the panel. Um, in our submission, and it's a technical area, I won't dwell, dwell, into it, I'll dwell on it too much, but Mr. Pryor has addressed landscape concerns. And it's interesting to note from my understanding yesterday of the discourse yesterday, it seemed that the concerns from Mr. Flavel and Lucy Rutherford were mainly concerned with the views coming down the Bombay Hills looking out to the south. Um, and in our submission, this site is, is a bit more discreet and we still um, suggest that it is appropriate for either the countryside living zone or the environmental um, approach that has been adopted by others. We, we support that as well as per the evidence. Just another area that um, came up yesterday, James, if we could maybe just go back to the, um, just the views of the, of the Zoom, thank you. Was the balance of jobs and housing, and there was some suggestion that we're overcooking residential versus jobs. And obviously that balance is important. Um, a couple of comments on that. Um, Mr. Thompson will go into it in more detail, but on page 39 of his evidence, he's provided a table of the jobs that are reasonably accessible to Pocono already and ones that are coming up. And there's about 30,000 jobs that are available now within a 20 to 30 minute commute. Now I appreciate commuting, still commuting, um, but, but, and there'll be up to 40,000 recently, and that's the areas like Pukekohe and Drury South, um, which the congestion on the Southern Motorway really mainly obviously um, is from Drury North. So there are jobs in the area, it, 
And it doesn't mean to say that there aren't jobs also in Pocono. And Mr. Thompson has pointed out that during a building phase, which Pocono is in, a lot of the employment is actually in the construction business. It's plumbers, electricians living in the area and constructing the township and other development. The other thing too, I think that it's important to appreciate, this is not the last shot at zoning for Pocono. And the Bunnings case in Queenstown made that very clear when a witness sort of somehow presented evidence as if this 10 years for the life of this district plan is the only opportunity for a certain activity to take place in the zone. Now, the, the court very much rejected that approach. It very much endorsed the idea that zoning is dynamic. We heard yesterday that there may be a, a suitable industrial area north of State Highway 2. There's nothing to stop the council or anybody else seeking a private plan change for further jobs-based areas um, in five years' time, two years' time, three years' time. So I wouldn't think that the balance is something that the panel should be overly concerned about at this stage. It is is a huge need for housing, um, and that is a, a top priority. It's a government national priority, and there are jobs that are accessible from the area. Can I just have the, um, the real estate? Now, in terms of the amount of growth, and this stems off, for example, the um, speaking notes from Mr. Botica that were circulated um, on the 11th of June. He's sort of gone through a fairly nuanced approach, thanks, James, of... Yeah, can, can you see that um, that shared screen yeah. with the, the figures? Yeah. Yes, we can. Maybe if you could delete the tab thing on the right, or well, whatever it's called, the column on the right-hand side that's got all the... Yeah, that get moved, yeah, that's better. Yes. So I don't know if you've got those speaking notes from Mr. Bodica in front of you, but he, he went through a fairly fine-grained analysis. And to, to his credit, he is now seeing, and, and Pocono Village Holdings do now seem to appreciate that some residential zoning on Pocono West is appropriate, but they're trying to rein it in, you might say, by this um, analysis, which he says is based on 140 dwellings per year over the last 10 years, and that will be no more over the next 10 years effectively, and then going in to sort of do some fairly minute calculations as to how many dwellings. Now, just for the sake of the panel, and this is me as a non-expert person, I'm not a valuer, but I just yesterday, I think it was yesterday or the day before, went in to look at real estate in Pocono and just brought up a sale and recent sales. And as you can see, you know, these are admittedly fairly large sites with four bedroom houses, 921, 915, a million and 35, 930. I mean, that's the product and the market, even in a fairly fringe area like Pocono at the moment, those are the prices that you have to pay to get into Pocono. Now, Mr. Thompson has pointed out that even in the council's own study, 85% of the demand in the Waikato is for dwellings under 580K, 85% of the demand. So in all reality, we actually don't know at all what the demand is for Pocono if we were supplying houses, for example, in the five to 600K range, which fits in with the Kiwi Build funding model as well. We just don't know what the demand will be. But for all intents and purposes, it's going to be strong and it's going to be high. So I have real difficulties with the approach that Mr. Bodica has taken, for example, um, in his very fine-grained analysis when the product that he's selling, for example, <laughs> Is this sort of cost, there's a lot of suppressed demand that's not being met due to these high prices. And that obviously affects affordability. The other thing which he's not fully appreciating is, and I think Mr. Dr. Davey and Mr. Um, Thompson have rightly assumed that you only get about 50% take up anyway. You can't assume that everything that's zoned is built. Uh, there's a sort of a, a fallacy in some ways that zone it and they will come. <laughs> zone it, it creates the opportunity, but there's a whole complex series of questions around building, which means that very often land sits idle for 10 years. So, Paul, um, yeah. I don't want to, <clears throat> sorry to interrupt you here, but I might just forget the, the oh. issue on, on this point. I, yes. I don't think I've read any evidence from your clients as to the pricing range 
you would offer properties at? Have you have you got that information? Yes, I think we do, um, Sarah. And I can't put, I can't put my finger on it right now, but Mr. Thompson sitting opposite me here, he's nodding, and rather than maybe me as a lawyer cover yeah. it, he's okay. made a note, and he will he will I think he, he they have done some demand estimates for different price ranges. And it's no, this Pocono is no different to other parts of the region. If you can supply houses in that five, six hundred thousand dollar range, those are new home buyers. Those uh, even investors now with new um, the new rules on taxation means that investment property, new property, is still exempt. So they could be potentially interested in investing in rental property, which we obviously need rental. But also, it's particularly those new home buyers. It's downsizes. You know, they might. Someone might move out of Auckland and go to an area like Pocono. They can still see the grandkids, but they can have a new home, have an RV, have a lifestyle, and put some money in the bank. Those are the sort of trends that that Mr. Thompson can speak to, and he does have numbers on different demand. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, we'll we'll hear from him, but I, I am interested in the uh, pricing estimates because you've got a property that is not easy, from what I can gather to develop given its um, slope and steepness. So uh, I'd be interested in the pricing range. Thank you, Sarah. And, and that raises an interesting point as well, because um, the higher the development costs, obviously the more intensive development is um, useful to actually cover those development costs. And that's why we don't quite know what the market will um, want to buy there, but we're very open, or well, the developers, of, the landowners are very open to actually new typologies like terraces and things like that. And Mr. Mead talked about that a little bit yesterday. If there may be a market for those, we don't know, but um, they would certainly increase the intensity of development, less rural land is needed, and they that would help overcome some of those higher development costs as well. So it's a good point. I might just, um, I am just mindful of time. I could um, talk more, but I would like to, um, just to be fair, spend a little bit of time with the submissions from Pocono Village Holdings, um, just to address some of the points that were raised in those. And I'll start with um, some case law that they cite at, um, I'll just find where they, at paragraph 4.8 of the Pocono Village Holdings submissions, we'll obviously hear from the signs tomorrow. Um, the, the North, North Show um, case and others. And I'd like the panel just to understand our perspective on how these cases relate to Pocono, because the suggestion is there's insufficient information and insufficient infrastructure for the panel to rezone the land that my clients own. So that's the basic premise. You need more modeling, you need more infrastructure, you need to prove that you can, you can do it. So it, it, it's a relevant question, but we feel that um, we can, in fact, address that. Um, and those cases are actually of assistance in that. So I think we'll start with the um, first one in the series, which is actually the McIntyre case. And James, we're bringing up, James, we're just bringing up the word versions with PF comments. So I'll just um, wait until that comes up on the screen. I have sent these through to Fletcher and he may have emailed them if you... If you <laughs> yeah, he oh, has, I'm, but um, I think it's fair to say we've, um, other than observing that they've arrived, that's the only attention we've given them thus far. I, I fully appreciate that. And um, that's why I just have highlighted from our perspective um, what we consider. So that's just starting to come up now. Um, so just, we don't have to labor the point, I suppose, but... Um, this case was probably one of the first ones which did establish the principle that when you're looking at a rezoning decision, it's appropriate to consider infrastructure and its funding. Can, can you see that case on the screen? No. Oh, okay. The, the guys are just working on that. Um, I'll just keep talking anyway, but it, it is appropriate to look at infrastructure. We don't disagree with that. Um, that's basically- There it is. Oh, no, no. You've got it now. You've got it now? Yeah. So for a start, this was a private plan change. So this was someone trying to do a plan change. You can see that at the front. 
this is quite different to this big public process that we're in, where the council is actually driving, particularly in, in regards to the area of Pocono West, which it notified, this is not a landowner trying to get something which will incur council costs. So this case, to a large extent, can be distinguished a little bit on that basis right at the outset. Um, it goes on to establish the principles that um, it is relevant to consider the provision of physical infrastructure, sewage, stormwater systems and roading, and that to be done at, at a rate that the community can afford. And that's common sense, isn't it? Um, but in this case, it did fail. Um, and it basically said that the residential subdivision would create an adverse effect on the council's ability to service it. Um, so we don't disagree with this outcome. This was a private plan change and it was basically inappropriate for the council to approve that because it wasn't funded and prepared to do the work and we can't force councils to do the work. But that's quite different to the council approach in Pocono where it's working with water care, it's working with NZTA, it's got massive growth um, strategies in place to develop Pocono as an area for future residential. So we're in a quite a different situation to this case in McIntyre. And then if we go, James, to the, and the, you, can, you can have a look at this in your leisure, um, but not that you have any leisure, that was probably the inappropriate word. <laughs> not at the moment. When you're on a panel. The, the Coleman case, if we just go to that. So this is another one in the series, and these may, may be familiar to the panel because they're sort of standards for, for referring to this issue. This was a poorly maintained existing rural road, probably a gravel road, and someone was seeking a subdivision of um, a property on this rural road. It already had issues, and as you can see from the case, the council estimated it was going to cost one or two mil to upgrade that road, and the council said no. <laughs> so that's again quite different to Pocono where we have the council promoting and funding through its long-term plan. Um, I've had a quick look at it. It's still in draft, but there's certainly projects allocated for Pocono on the long-term plan. Um, and the council's not coming to this hearing from my understanding and saying we can't service any growth in Pocono. It's preparing itself to service growth. So that's again quite different to an individual seeking to subdivide using a public road that's already got a safety issue and the council, and it's going to quite take one or two mil to upgrade and the council saying no. Fair enough. The next yeah, last... Mr Fuller, it, it comes down to the likelihood of, of providing um, infrastructure, doesn't it? Yes, yeah, so, well, there's very interesting use of words there. And, and whether it's likelihood or the feasibility, I, I, I referred to the, the word feasible that was used in the unitary plan. Again, I'm not saying you should necessarily adopt that. But yes, the NPS talks about likelihood, I think, of, of, of servicing. It's not that pipes have to be in the ground, but the, the key point here is that even in the um, Pocono Village Holdings submissions and their technical experts, what that none of them have said it can't be serviced. Our, our clients land. What they're saying is there's a few questions with some stormwater modelling and things like that and that's fine and we accept that and those will be resolved before subdivision consent is granted. The last case I think is, is quite instructive which is the North Show one. Um, this was for a managed, this is the one they primarily relied on because it's, it, it quoted um, that fairly classic statement and it's um, at paragraph 92 of that case. Yeah, can you, can you see that on the screen? Yeah. So, yeah. Go down to 92, it's, it's got a, it's, it's, sorry, this will get there just so you can see it as we talk about it. It's got a fairly um, classic RMA type sound statement of principle. Um, if we could just maybe <laughs> move the pictures for now, I'll move them. It is a bad resource management practice and contrary to the purpose of the Act to zone land for an activity when the infrastructure necessary to allow that activity to occur without adverse effects on the environment does not exist and there is no commitment to provide it. 
I mean, that, that's fair enough. We don't actually disagree with that, but it's very important to look at this case in the round. Um, it is a court, and then it goes on to say it's according the open to the council to refuse a plan change. But this is where it gets interesting. Those are the bits that were quoted by P, um, Pocono Village Holdings. But if you look at 94, so while we accept that the, the court may decline resource consent where the effects of the new activity would exceed the capacity of the site and the surrounding environment, we are not convinced in the present case can be properly characterised in that, in that way. Now, in my legal submissions, I've actually said that all power rests with the council about infrastructure. We accept that, and that's what this case here is endorsing, that at the time of subdivision, if we haven't got wastewater sorted, <laughs> we haven't got a consent. So notwithstanding zoning, developers understand that they have to provide services. Um, what the court went on to, and I'll, I won't spend too long on this, but the real issue was regarding the management of the roads, and it went on to actually find, can you believe it, um, at 101, um, that the, the issues with servicing, this was a landfill, it was going to have an impact on the road, but the court, this is a recent case, um, the principal um, environment court judge now, we consider relevant consideration in our discretion as open to the agency itself. So there is a responsibility for the agencies to resolve these issues. Um, around decision-making, we consider that the road upgrading issue in this case can be squarely addressed by the road controlling authority through a number of the options and management of the road as outlined above. And it went all through the powers that, that they have. So when Mr. Edwards, um, for example, for Pocono Village Holdings said there will be some roading upgrading, what this court is saying is that's not the applicant's responsibility, that is the responsibility of the agencies, unless there's an articulate intersection, as we know, with the resource consent that you can ping on an application. There, there is a responsibility for the agencies to service land and development, and that's what this court is saying. So we actually think that the case they're intending to rely on is indeed actually helpful um, for the rezoning of the Pocono West and other land because um, it, it highlights that this is a partnership with agencies that have the power to put in the infrastructure. Now, the other thing which I might just touch on with regards to the approach in Pocono Village Holdings is at one point they're saying, and this is, I think, one of the major weaknesses in the way that they framed their argument, they're saying that there's a lack of commitment to public infrastructure. We don't disagree. With, we don't agree with that, and they are also sceptical about my client's ability to put in infrastructure in. But then they actually talk within the legal submissions, and I could refer to the paragraphs, but you would have read them, where they um, triumph the fact that the development consortium has been very successful at providing infrastructure. So for me, that's a major inconsistency. There's no reason why the developers on the Pocono Westland and CSL and Top End, whoever the developers are, we're talking with the landowners here, um, whoever the developers are, have every opportunity to enter into development agreements with the council to, to provide infrastructure anyway. So <laughs> within those submissions is actually the mechanism to deal with infrastructure as has been dealt with in the past in Pocono, um, by their own experience. Um, so those are some of the key points that I wanted to make. There could be others, but um, I'm just mindful of time and I'm very happy to, to answer any questions if that's the most value to the council, if there's anything that um, we need to address in terms of particular questions that I can assist with at this stage. All right, thank you, Mr. Fuller. Um, let's worry about the questions of the consequentials once we've heard from the witnesses, but in terms of your submissions, let's see if there are any questions. Mr. Fulton? Uh, no, I have no questions at this stage, thank you. No. Ms. Gibb? Uh, no, but what crosses my mind is um, you're seeking live zoning, aren't you, um, to work with Block 20. Um, so time-wise, are, are your clients in a position to get cracking, so to speak? Um, absolutely. Um, and there was a suggestion that my clients may not have the legs to do the development, which I thought was a little bit um, inappropriate. But I can rest, the panel can be rest assured that there's good, solid um, 
people behind those developments. And anyway, this is a curious thing, they are open to negotiation with the um, Dines Consortium <laughs> about future projects anyway. So um, we, we would actually like to think that there's a constructive relationship here, um, potentially going forward. I'm not saying there will be a commercial relationship, but obviously they will be looking for opportunities. And I know that one of the owners of one of the blocks is quite open to discussing future possibilities. So I think that one of the key points that uh, Mr. Thompson has made also is you have had a very limited supply of um, land developers in Pocono. You're going to have potentially up to four or five active land developers and interests, and that will only be good for having a functioning property market, which is what the NPS requires. So I would strongly urge not, in our client's case, to go to anything like a fuzz. That'll just put it in a loop of years of delay. Um, we, you'll probably get caught up in RMA reform, as I've said, even local government reform. The government's looking at reform, three waters reform. There's all these changes that are happening. In my view, um, live zoning is just the absolutely only way to go for, for those sites. Thank you, Mr. Fuller. Thank you, Ms. Sedgwick. Um, I have no questions for Mr. Fuller, thank you. Ms. Te'aho. No questions, thank you for your submissions. Um, <coughs> I'll ask questions of the, uh, of the witnesses. Thank you. Mr. Cooney. Mr. Cooney. Um, yeah, just on um, the NPS, PSUD, you said um, that Mr. Mead took a target approach at that's not what he told us yesterday. He said that he took um, more of a broad view of an overs and unders type approach because I think I put to him the NPS doesn't it doesn't require you to have exact numbers as which is the point you make. And he said, no, I've taken a broad view of it. What 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 do you say about that? Um, I, yeah, maybe I, maybe I was a little unkind. Um, I suppose what I was trying to imply is that, um, you know, it's taken broad view, yes, and, and we agree with that, but, but I suppose that we shouldn't get too um, um, concerned, I suppose, about whether it's 9.5 years of growth or 10.5, <laughs> you yeah. know. It's, the, the, the NPS is clearly, it's, it uses the word bottom line. And, and it's uses it several several places. And I think that's a very powerful signal that if we've got 15 years residential, better. <coughs> you know, it's it's not a matter of trying to get absolutely to 10 years and yeah. no more. So that's that's all I was commenting on. Yeah. Um, and, and and I suppose it was particularly in, re, in regard to the approach taken by Mr. Bodica, which is very much that, you know, 140 houses per year, that's all we'll ever be, and we've got 10 years, you know, and so he's taken that very, very um, targeted approach, in my view. Yeah. Okay. Just, um, if uh, there was an argument, uh, I think Mr. Mead says, no, you shouldn't be going above the RL100 line for your country living development. Um, <clears throat> if we were to accept that recommendation, how many how many country living zone dwellings would that exclude? If, if we if we eliminate about 100 RL CSL. on CSL, yeah. Yes, Mr. Um, Mr. Oakley can deal with that in some detail. But just as a heads up number, I understand there's about 25 on either side of the line. Um, but we would certainly encourage the pen, so we'd lose 25 or half of them. Um, so. But I would certainly encourage the panel to, to question Mr. Pryor um, on that also, because we do think that there's mitigation. I mean, this is not residential development like you, you see in Pocono with a, a sea of grey roofs. These are, these are blocks um, clustered. We could do that approach. Recessive colours, a lot of bush planting. So for all intents and purposes, it'll be executed very well and it will probably look better than just open pasture. Um, but that's that's a technical issue. I'll let the planner and the landscape architect speak about that further. But it would be about losing half. Okay. Um, the that um, that case you quoted, um, the last the last one you quoted. Yes. Um, that did the road in in that case. It just wasn't up to scratch, but it wasn't. 
it wasn't a roading situation where the road was so bad um, it would it would it didn't warrant granting uh, any rezoning because uh, because no one was prepared to improve that road. Is that is that the sort of threshold? Yes, I think so. And um, yes, you're absolutely right. It wasn't that there was an identified tra uh, traffic safety risk or, or anything from my reading of the case. Um, again, um, Mr. Hills can probably comment further. It more was, this is a landfill. There will be a lot of trucks. It's going to have an impact. Um, so who's responsible for that? And the fact of that impact was not a reason to decline the consent. In fact, the court was quite clear, AT had all its powers to be able to upgrade roads. It's a bit similar to that, um, the old case at Lunav uh, with Windstone Quarries, where you know the wider network effects of a development is something that just has to be borne by the agencies that are dealing with that. They get money and funding for that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cooney. Um, I have no questions. Thank you, Mr. Fuller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I'll introduce um, Mr. Birch. So um, you can lead off with his um, summary from the development perspective. Uh, Mr. Chairman and um, panel, this today, of course, is the culmination of a huge amount of work over a long period of time. It was very early in 2018 that we were asked to put together a team of specialists to um, uh, work with the uh, Waikato District Council in um, uh, proposing the development of the, initially the Munro Block and subsequently the, uh, the CSL and top end property blocks. Uh, and through 2018, we, um, we had a number of uh, workshops and very good discussions with the council and their, their own specialists um, before our team uh, uh, began and um, prepared their own uh, uh, submissions and uh, uh, undertook a very comprehensive whole catchment approach to the development of, of the, the land that's is the subject of our hearing today. Um, and the, you'll hear from, a, from all of those specialist consultants who are in the room at the moment, uh, and they will be taking you through the, the work that they undertook. But just to give you a sense of the breadth and the depth of the team that we had, um, we, uh, we have Maven civil engineering consultants who are very well-known Auckland uh, uh, consulting team with offices throughout the North Island. Uh, we have Ge Ground Consulting Limited, Geotech Specialists, who've um, got a very wide knowledge of the soils and the geology of uh, South Auckland, have done extensive work um, throughout the region and indeed wider. Um, Leo Hills is one of the prominent uh, transportation consultants. Um, uh, his, his company, Commute, uh, a, a very highly respected uh, uh, specialist on that field. Um, we have uh, Jenny Shanks here from JS Ecology. Jenny spent an enormous amount of time um, going right through the property and uh, identifying the biodiversity and the the rather special areas that exist, uh, particularly in the upper reaches of the catchment where there are some very nice stands of kaikatea and, uh, and canopy trees, which are going to be protected as a result of the proposals. Um, the LA4, the uh, Rob from LA4 is here with us today, who's done the visual assessments and the landscape uh, assessments. Uh, and he'll have quite a lot of things to say to you. Um, we've had a, um, a number of prominent urban designers, and we've got today with us Ian Monroe, who will be known to, to you all. Um, 
Billy Ho, who's an architect and employed by CSL, did the urban design work on the CSL uh, property and on uh, Top End. Um, and earlier on, we had another team from Construct who did the, the early master planning, uh, which was a basis for the, um, the structure planning, which is undertaken by the engineering consultants and, and others. Uh, on a, as I say, on a, uh, a holistic um, total catchment basis. Um, from our own office, uh, James Oakley's been on the project for those three and a half years uh, and has steadily worked his way to um, get, bring the team together to where we are today. And uh, to say that I'm very, very proud of his efforts. And um, uh, in the area of uh, population growth forecasts and economic analysis. Uh, Adam Thompson's been a, a great, uh, great assistance to us, and uh, you'll benefit from his uh, evidence again today. Um, so the, the the combination of of the work of that team uh, has led, has led us to be very confident about the quality of the uh, development that's proposed. Um, and uh, uh, that we that live zoning will be uh, of great benefit to the community of Pocono because this catchment is, is is the obvious area for a lot of that population growth to take place. Now, now Pocono uh, itself uh, has a range of topography and contour, and a lot of the development that's been done. Uh, is of similar contour, the, where the Carter block's been developed, extensive earthworks have been undertaken there. We're hoping in the development of uh, this catchment that we can minimise the earthworks. We want to, uh, to the extent possible, to uh, preserve the, uh, the form and the character of the of the catchment. But some earthworks will be possible and. Uh, we're satisfied that where uh, there are issues of steep contours uh, and stormwater issues that they can be engineered to provide a very satisfactory outcome. Um, it's it's uh, very clear I, to us on, that the, uh, the housing crisis and the population growth and the demand for housing in the Auckland region and in South Auckland in particular um, really needs to be addressed urgently and, uh, and we see Pocono as supplying a, uh, a, a, a significant contribution to dealing with that, that issue. Um, the, um, we are actually disappointed somewhat about the uh, suggestion that the western part of the CSL property uh, be left rural. We think that is not in the best interests of Pocono. The the essentially the uh, the visual limit of that of our catchment uh, on the western side is Ridge Road, and that's that's above the hundred metre contour. Uh, we agree with that, but that that is the that is the skyline looking up the up to the catchment to the west is Ridge Road. Uh, we think that it would be advantageous for the, uh, uh, even the areas above the 100 metre contour uh, to be looked at from a, a visual and from a uh, environmental point of view so that the, uh, the, 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 the ridges can be planted and cluster development permitted where it wasn't going to be visually uh, obtrusive uh, and that would provide the best background rather than just leaving uh, those steep slopes much of which have got uh, biodiversity value in in, uh, in, in, in rural uh, grazed land I mean, there's quite a lot of biodiversity up there that should be protected it would benefit from the planting uh, and the the accommodation of housing in, in small clusters um, would be beneficial to the uh, 
for the overall outcome of the development of the catchment. Um, so it'll be, we're going to ask Billy Ho and the and the landscape architect to say a little bit more about that with his evidence. Um, we we have, um, we're very uh, mindful of the debate about uh, density and the issue about should we zone for high density areas and should we zone for neighbourhood uh, centres? Um, we think that where David Mead finally settled and his advice to you is, is correct, that it's um, better to keep those issues um, in, in front of us. And as we get into detailed uh, design of the resource consents that we achieve where it is appropriate and um, beneficial to introduce some high density housing and to ensure that the neighborhood uh, centers or two are proposed through the catchment uh, located in the best possible places. But flexibility is the key to that because uh, more detailed design work is necessary uh, and um, we'll have the best advice available in the country to, to where those higher density areas should go and where the uh, neighborhood centers should go. Um, we do hope that the panel will uh, consider further the, the that western area of the CSL property. Um, we think it'd be a great shame that it was not uh, considered as part of the overall development and the uh, special areas of biodiversity are protected and planted uh, and that the steeper areas may also be protected and planted with emphasis on ensuring that we have a good a visual landscape outcome uh, and that uh, can accommodate cluster housing identified pretty much in the same way as, the, as, uh, as Havelock Village has proposed on the um, slopes between uh, around Tata Valley development. We think, we think that's a very good outcome for Avalok Village. We think that's going to give a very good result. And equally, we think a similar approach in this catchment on the western side of the CSL property would be the best outcome long-term uh, for Pocono. Um, so, and so just to be clear, we although we haven't actually undertaken detailed design for the hamlets and the final areas for planting, we think that can be dealt with under the uh, environmental uh, planning uh, provisions in the district plan and, uh, and a good detailed plan can be uh, produced uh, for the council in due course. Um, in terms of um, whether the owners are shovel ready, well, they are very keen to achieve uh, live zoning and they'll be very keen to uh, <clears throat> work with developers and the council to ensure that the infrastructure and the, and the housing sites become available as soon as possible. The, the uh, speed of development I obviously will be determined by market demand, but we think that having uh, some competition into the, in the in the uh, uh, in the whole of the Pocono area will be beneficial. That there'll be um, opportunities for new home buyers to choose between developments of one developer or another, and the introduction of competition will be benefit beneficial to the uh, district uh, as well. Um, so um, uh, I, I certainly welcome all our consultants here today and. Uh, just take the opportunity collectively to say thank you to them for their work over the last two or three years and for their uh, advice to us and for their dedication and uh, efforts that they've made to accommodating into our in our hearing today. So if we if there are any questions by the panel, I'd be very glad to answer them. If there are specialist questions, uh, I may I may uh, suggest that they be directed to one of the consultants, but. Uh, in terms of context or the management of the project at large, 
I'm very happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Sir William. Let's see if there are any questions. I think with that um, rave review of your consultant team, you've probably almost guaranteed that they're going to put pick their fees up for the next phase of the project, but I'll leave that for you to figure out. Um, now, their fees yeah. are very, very tightly managed, Mr. Chairman. I, can show I see. You. Very good. So nothing's changed. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see if there's any questions, Mr. Fulton. Yeah, no, thank you. Thanks for the overview. I think it was very helpful to us to have a big picture painted. Thank you. Ms. Cedric? Um, I have questions, but I will save them for uh, the... Uh, the RAVE team, thank you. Good on you. Ms. Teoho? I'm not sure who to, I've just been going through the summary statements, but I do want to ask a question about um, how the vision and strategy to Te Whai Mana has been given effect to. Um, and so I'm not sure which person would answer that question. Could you perhaps clarify the question, Linda, just for us? Yeah, sure. So um, Mr. Fuller talked a lot about infrastructure and in particular there's an issue around stormwater and three waters generally. Um, and we've heard a lot about the slopes and, and the impact um, that that might have and whether the sports field is going to need to be used for that. There are some streams that are in wetlands that that are located in the area. And so I'm just trying to find out where, whether it's in the primary evidence or whether anybody talks about it in there. I'm just trying to go back through that hurriedly now, um, where anybody actually talks about how the proposal would give effect to the objectives um, that puts the, the health and well-being of the of the Waikato River and all it embraces, so that includes wetlands and tributaries and streams, etc., and and dealing with um, the three waters issues, um, how that's given effect to those objectives. Uh, look, I, look, I understand your question now uh, much much better. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think um, I think you you're correct in, in that. Um, I, I mean. We've got a group of specialists here. Each one um, has their own speciality. I think the, the questions around stormwater modelling, flood protection, um, and those sort of issues about the, the stormwater treatment discharges, ensuring that the downstream effects are mitigated. Um, we've got Will Moore here from Maven Engineering, who's done that modelling, he'd be the best person to ask. Um, uh, Jenny Shanks, our, our ecologist, is here. She has spent quite a lot of time on the ground, a lot of time looking at the national policy statements on biodiversity and uh, stream protection and, and, and clean water. Uh, she's the best one to ask about those issues. Uh, we've got Rob here from LA Ford, the landscape specialist, very well-known landscape architect who's highly regarded in Auckland, uh, was able to talk to you about uh, the visual effects. Um, we've, we, um, we've, we're very conscious about those, those things. We, we also, uh, we've, I've, I've quite enjoyed actually reading uh, David uh, Meads uh, Section 42 reports because um, I think all of us at times uh, become concerned about sometimes the the conflict between national policy statements on the one hand the council being required by the government to accommodate population growth forecasts and to have live zoning available at the same time not being able to build on versatile soils so where are you going to build uh, and uh, the issue about um, uh, protection of, of wetlands and uh, the need to, you know, protect the quality of the water and to treat the treat the discharges from the, the roofs and the impermeable areas. You know how that's done. Um, well, you know we've got all the team in the room today that can answer those questions. Um, so as they as they come up, I suggest that you. Uh, explore it with, with some vigour. 
Yeah, thank you. So I was just been looking back through the evidence and just don't see those explicit statements about the vision and strategy in particular. I can see that they've addressed, um, you know, as you say, different aspects, but yeah, just an explicit response about how the vision and strategy is from each of those uh, witnesses would be great. Okay. Uh, thanks very much for that. Maybe if I can just jump in. Yes, th there's sort of two components to the question, the way we understand it. One is the technical, which is will more primarily, but in terms of meeting the objectives and policies of the vision and strategy, um, James, yeah. uh, Mr Oakley, the planner will certainly um, speak to that question. So thank you for that. All right, thank you. Ms Gibb? No, nothing from me, thank you. Mr Koenig? No, thank you. No, and I don't have any questions either. Thank you, Sir William. Thank you, Mr Chair, and thank you, Sir William. Um, prob probably did the introduction of the team that I should have done, but he did it much better, so <laughs> there you go. Um, did, did, you get a, did you get a mention? <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I think so. Well, my memory's a bit fuzzy, but um, that's okay. Um, Fraser, I'll ask Fraser Walsh to um, come now because he can then get away, but he did the geotechnical work and um, I think it's probably one of the least controversial areas, but the panel may have a different view. Um, but he can speak to his um, statement. He's just getting set up. If you can just provide a bit of a... Um, apologies to the panel, but we sort of um, slipped up in terms of him providing a summary statement, but his brief was fairly short and we have briefed him to just to um, give the panel a, a snapshot of highlights this morning. Thank you. So he's going to do that. Yeah, good morning. Um, my name is Fraser Walsh. I was asked uh, about two years ago to provide a geotechnical appraisal of the proposed uh, developments. Uh, I think probably rather than going through my evidence in any sort of particular order, I think the best thing to do would be to go to the figures uh, that are at the end of the evidence, if that can be brought up on screen. Oh, Fletcher can probably do it. I've got it here, I think if I've got the rights, yeah, I, I can do that, I think. I have to. Is that what you're referring to? These ones? Yes, yes, that that's the one. So, right. so basically, what I was asked to do was provide a geotechnical appraisal of uh, the proposed plan change areas. Um, they encompass the areas of the CSL trust block, uh, the top end properties, and the Munro block as well. Uh, I was. Uh, it was more of a top end uh, type survey where it involved site mapping and field mapping, as well as looking at the topography, et cetera, just to see uh, what I felt um, were some of the potential geotechnical constraints uh, that might have uh, come up as a result of the mapping that I did. Uh, so that's really summarized in the figures uh, at the back of the evidence. And in those figures, you'll see there, and this is sort of represented really in the way that they, uh, way it's proposed in terms of the zoning of these particular areas where there's medium uh, density residential type housing I see within the more Eastern portions. If you want to get that, them to get that map up. Yeah, either. So if we, um, if you uh, go to figure two. Uh, so you got drawing, yeah, that's the one. So, so that just sort of shows some of the mapping that was undertaken, uh, where you see within the eastern portion of the block, you have a lot more, that's the green colored topography. Uh, so that's gently sloping topography where there isn't much slope involved. Uh, areas like that are obviously much more conducive to medium density type residential housing and earthworks. Uh, and then as you progress slowly uh, and surely to the west of that block, you'll see that the areas of yellow, which sort of corresponds to moderately and steep slopes, uh, progressively increases. And that's the same trend that we also see with the other blocks as well, uh, where we have a sort of a, an east to west progression in terms of 
uh, how the slopes progressively steepen as you go west. So basically out of that, um, I have, if you then go on to uh, figure three, uh, drawing three, I've provided some, I guess you call it geotechnical zones. Uh, so zone A is the green zone. Uh, again, that corresponds to the type of topography that we observed and the geotechnical features that we observed too. Uh, so zone A is gently sloping. It's certainly conducive to uh, median density uh, and high density residential uh, type housing. Uh, we have zone C, you'll see there within the southwestern portion of the block, and that's lower lying areas. Uh, so there might be some constraints involved with some of those areas involved in terms of uh, potentially weaker ground, higher groundwater tables, et cetera. Um, but I do note though that uh, most of the major gullies and watercourses uh, that run through that particular block uh, are noted as being left alone and being planted out. Uh, then as we go through to the western part of the block, you'll see the UC zone B, which is the yellow shaded uh, topography. And that there is more, uh, as they've got its countryside living areas is mostly located within zone B. So countryside living um, requires significantly less earthworks than what you'd need to in terms of the development of medium density residential housing. Essentially for earthworks, uh, you would need to uh, develop level platforms for the actual house sites themselves. Uh, and obviously you'd need to create roading to those house sites. Um, but in terms of the remainder of that zone that could largely be left untouched. And, and I, again, I see in terms of the way that it's um, been zoned, uh, most of the gullies that run through that zone B area are effectively untouched, planted out and left as is. So I agree with the type and style of development uh, for the CSL trust zone. I think it sort of makes best use of the land uh, geotechnically. And um, for the medium density area, it's of very similar contour to what we see in some of the other major subdivisions that have already been constructed in the Pocono area. And that's um, obviously the Pocono village area that runs between Helensley Road and the motorway. Um, that had very uh, similar type topography that we see within the Eastern area of the CSL Trust subdivision and also in the Hitchens block, et cetera, uh, in the Southeast of Pocono. So I guess I don't really need to say much more than that, really just that um, I feel that <coughs> the style of development that is proposed uh, in terms of a mix of, of you know, high and, and medium residential type housing within the Western area, uh, sorry, within the Eastern area and within the Western area, countryside living type uh, living and, and, and zoning is appropriate for the geotechnical constraints as they present themselves. Uh, there's also the other area that I had a look at is to the south of CSL Trust, and I think that's area number 20. 20, yeah. And, and again, it, it's, um, if you could bring that up. Um, uh, so that's not in that document, it's in no. another, yeah, yeah, another yeah, piece yeah. that I provided. Right. It's going to take me a minute to find, hang on. Yeah, sure. Mr. Chair, I have it in front of me if you'd like me to put it up. Oh, yeah, that'd be great. Yes, please. Yeah, so again, it's it's very much mapping in the same vein as the CSL Trust, uh, as the CSL uh, holdings uh, to the north. Uh, so this is to the south. We're sort of basically dropped out to the south now. And again, it's a very similar pattern where there is gently... Uh, rolling slopes um, uh, within the eastern portion of the subdivision and as we go west it progressively steepens. Uh, and again the zones that come out of that if you just uh, jump to figure three yes. um, are, are very similar in itself too. So you see the next two figures are effectively just sort of taking a, a northern a northern chunk of that zone and then the other figure is a southern chunk of that zone. Uh, again uh, they are reflecting the fact of a whole series of, of uh, steep gullies that 
transect through the western portion of the site and then as you go towards the east um, the topography significantly lessens again that matches quite nicely with the style of, of uh, development that is proposed for uh, that particular block um, yeah so that's really a summary of my evidence very good thank you mr walsh i'll check with the panel to see if there are any questions for you um ms gibb no nothing it was very clear thank you oh. ms sedgwick um, I wonder if you might make comment, and I know you've touched on it throughout your evidence. Um, what effect would you expect uh, subdivision and infrastructure uh, to have on the ground flow and the water and, and the groundwater tables, sorry, and the overland flow paths on the underlying soils? Um, and I'm thinking that you're at the top. That's then going to go down to uh, number 20 to the Munro block. Uh, what, what's your opinion on the amount of water that we know is endemic in Pocono? So if you're, so you're referring to surface water flows or groundwater flows or both? I'm probably referring to both and thinking of the impact of um, a, a loss of um, permeable surface. Yeah, sure. So I, I think Will is uh, touching on, uh, from Mavens, uh, touching on the civil type side of things in terms of dealing with stormwater. So I think that's probably a question better uh, reserved for him. I, mean, I guess in quick summary, it does increase stormwater you know, outflow, but not without a subdivision itself. So the rules are quite clear that you can't generate, um, the, well, the way that you handle stormwater, you have to do it in a very careful way so that you're not creating flooding effects downstream. Uh, but again, we'll, we'll handle but, that. So my question is, is related to the soils. Are the <laughs> soils capable of, of, of managing and handling that? Or would you expect that it have to be a far more extensive uh, catchment management plan put in place? Yes, so generally the soils within the western portion of the site, that, that's the more steeply sloping parts. Um, they will, uh, the, the soakage ability of those soils is, is a lot more reduced. Um, however, on saying that though, with the proposed planting uh, that is going to be going on through the gullies, it will actually improve that significantly um, because basically pasture land has got to be the worst form of, of any water retention uh, style of land management you can possibly uh, create. Um, it, it just sheds water very, very readily. So by changing it to these big planted areas that are proposed, that will help that significantly. In regards to the eastern portion of the subdivision where there is medium density, et cetera, type housing, um, I, I don't know what, this, what the specific idea around stormwater disposal is for that area, um, but normally it would involve a combination of soakage structures uh, and, and detention ponds and holding ponds, et cetera. Uh, that would manage stormwater from those areas. Uh, but again, I, that sort of hasn't been my particular brief. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Tiaho? No questions from me, thank you. Mr. Fulton? Yeah, just one, and maybe come up in transport, but the um, servicing of the countryside living area that you referred to, was that intended to be serviced from Ridge Road or was it intended to be serviced from uh, the bottom end? Uh, of, uh, yeah, that, that's definitely outside of my area. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cooney? Uh, yes, Mr. Walsh, what, what's the um, degree of difficulty to develop uh, these sites? Is it physically, is it a difficult, are they difficult sites to to develop? There's a lot of cut and fill and, and um, that type of thing. Yeah, it, it depends really on the, the style of residential housing that occurs. So if you have medium density residential type housing where you do need to generally provide gently sloping type sites and a lot of subdivision infrastructure and eroding, et cetera, which is in the eastern portion of those subdivisions, uh, to me, it, it's a similar scale of earthworks that would be required for much of the other subdivisions that have gone to Pocono so far um, in terms of the scale of, and size of earthworks. As you would go towards the west uh, into that sort of countryside living type zone, there the earthworks is substantially reduced. And the reason why is because you only have to provide 
safe and stable house sites for the actual building platforms themselves. Uh, you don't have to provide safe and stable, an entire uh, land package that's safe and stable. You only have to basically provide safe and stable infrastructure in terms of getting roads up there and the actual building platforms themselves. So the earthworks along those particular areas would just essentially involve <laughs> flattening of ridge crests and things like that. Uh, the soil excavated from those ridge crests would be most likely put down into the eastern portion uh, of that um, particular block to fill up maybe potentially some of the lower lying areas, et cetera. But I guess in terms of scale of earthworks, certainly nothing different than what's been required for the other subdivisions that have gone on and are currently under construction in Pocono. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Mr. Kearney. I don't have any questions. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank just you, checked over 10.30, so I think we might take our morning break now and we'll resume at 10 to 11. Thank you. Just check. All right, thank you, everybody. We'll resume. Um, Mr. Fuller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And maybe just before we start with Mr. Thompson, just to answer a question from Commissioner Tiaho. Um, sorry if I'm pronouncing the name not quite correctly, but <laughs> um, yes, in terms of the vision strategy, it was addressed in uh, Mr. Oakley's primary evidence, if you take a note, um, 17 February, so that's Mr. Oakley for Pocono West at paragraph 65 is where he starts to go through that analysis. He will go through that and, 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 and address that also when he speaks, but I just thought you might like that reference because otherwise we have to wait till the end of the day when uh, Mr Oakley will actually be presenting and you may wish to have a look at that analysis prior. So that's where that analysis is covered in terms of the Wakata River. And just maybe before, um, just a couple of points to note with Mr Walsh, um, there has been an allegation as the panel will be aware that there are geotechnical problems and the site shouldn't be developed. Apparently it was looked at historically and rejected. Um, the, but I would like to emphasise that um, Mr Walsh is the only geotechnical witness before the panel, from my understanding, and he has approved that the site is capable of development. There will, of course, be site-specific engineering required at the design and construction stage, but otherwise he is um, happy with development occurring on the site. It's not really that much different to a lot of sites up near the back of Oriwa, for example, where there's a lot of... Um, geotechnical challenges as well. Um, and also I'd like to just emphasize when you particularly see his maps, how, how responsive the design and the master plan has been to the topography and the stream systems, et cetera. We are trying to respect the natural landforms as much as possible. It's not just sort of one of those totally obliterate the natural topography types of developments that is proposed here. It is trying to respond to the natural landforms and, and respect those. So um, there will be a bit of earthworks, but as we're trying to minimise it by only putting appropriate development in certain areas as per the um, countryside living on the high areas, for example, which doesn't require the same level of engineering. So I just sort of... Mr Fuller, what I'm trying to get a handle on is the degree of difficulty and cost involved um, because you've raised the issue about the uh, expensive nature of the development that currently exists at Pocono and the suggestion is that you'll be able to come in with competitive pricing uh, and um, well, in, in relation to that I'm really trying to say well we'll find out well uh, how difficult is this property to develop and what sort of costs are involved and where does that translate into uh, how does that translate into uh, cost cost um, pricing yes it's a fair it's a fair question and and from my understanding we haven't really gone down the whole full cost development route at this stage it is just a zone change um, we certainly will be looking to provide affordable housing, and that's why density can be important to overcome those development costs. Mr. Thompson may, in fact, be able to speak to development costs, but the panel will be fully aware that there is this kernel that we have in Auckland, that if you want to develop flat land, which is the cheapest to develop, it's generally elite or prime soil, because that's how soil forms. It forms on good flat land where it doesn't basically erode and it builds up over millennium. 
if you're actually looking to avoid the best horticultural and um, farmland and, and the best soils, you are generally into slightly steeper country. And so that is one of those trade-offs that um, we don't sometimes appreciate, um, but I think that this is an appropriate location because it's right next to an existing town centre. It's not the best soils. Yes, there will be some costs with development, but those are effectively the developer's responsibility. Um, and we think that the project is still very feasible. Thank you. So, Mr. Thompson, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Good morning, Mr. Chair and panel. Uh, I want to have, have a few um, key figures which I think I'll run through. Um, it doesn't follow my summary statement, so um, it's, um, it's really just what I consider to be some, some high level um, context for this um, submission. So I, th I think understanding um, the district-wide housing market is, is a big part of this. Um, I know a lot of the evidence focuses just on Pocono, but um, really Pocono is a big part of the Waikato housing market. So the, the key numbers there are that the council estimates demand for, for 7,100 additional dwellings over the next 10 years for the district. And of those 6,200, or 85%, uh, for dwellings that are less than 580,000. So there, there really are, there are two considerations with regard to the housing market. One is the quantity, how many houses need to be provided, and the other, which is often not considered in as much detail, but in my opinion is equally or more important, is the price of those houses that can be supplied to the market. So under 580,000 really is what the district needs to, uh, to provide to the community. And I would respectfully suggest to the panel that that's a critical consideration with, with regard to um, residential land policy for the district. Uh, Pocono, when I started this research, was selling properties for around $600,000 to $800,000 for a three and four bedroom family home. Um, since then, uh, just over a year ago, they've jumped up and now you can't really get anything in Pocono for under $800,000 and some properties have even sold for more than 1 million. So uh, the market really is running away a little bit in Pocono and its historic position in the market of having affordable housing is being eroded. Uh, and that's unfortunate in my opinion, but not something that can't be fixed. Um, part of what's driving that is there is a regional shortage. So Auckland has uh, a shortage of 45,000 dwellings and Waikato um, region has a shortage of 8,000 dwellings. So that's a substantial issue for the district and those numbers don't seem to make their way into any of these demand and supply estimates that the different evidence addresses. But at the high level, I think that's the context for the panel to um, revert back to when they're considering some of these applications. Uh, just in terms of demand, um, I have um, done a graph uh, in one of my rebuttal statements, which I, I think should be on the screen now. Uh, I think this is the, the best way of understanding what the demand in the Waik uh, sorry, in Pocono will be um, over the next five and 10 years. So this shows uh, the last 20 years of construction of new dwellings in Pocono. And you can see around 2002 when Pocono Village um, starts, uh, there, there are around um, 10 dwellings being built per annum there. And then very consistently over the, the last um, eight years, it's, it's increased up to about 280 dwellings per annum. So you can see with this new development entering the market, uh, the demand has, has come uh, in response to that supply. And that has gradually trended up as that development has improved, uh, as the buyers can see what they are getting into in terms of the development and the amenities. Uh, and, and also uh, the other things that have happened in the, in the town, uh, for example, the supermarket um, coming along, which is a, a big thing for a family household who are the primary market in Pocono, first home buyer, young families. So on that um, graph, you can see the, the increase um, over time. Um, and at the top there, most recently, as of uh, last year, 280 dwellings per annum. So just to run through some of the different demand estimates, uh, Dr. Davies says 237, uh, Mr. Mead says 215, uh, Mr. Bodica says 140. Um, I believe it'll be higher than all of those when you, when you look at that trend. 
I expect it would be up to four to 500 over the next decade, particularly with some new developments entering the market and providing more options for purchases. Um, it's, it's always difficult to forecast demand uh, for a place like Pocono because the historic data doesn't really help you understand demand and it does rely on um, understanding the, the key principles rather than a technical, analytical, quantitative analysis, in my opinion. And I think Pocono is well placed to attract more buyers, particularly if it can continue to have uh, affordable housing uh, relative to the, uh, the main centres in Hamilton City and in Auckland. Uh, so in terms of capacity and uh, in regard to what Mr. Mead has um, recommended approval for and some of the other submissions, um, Fraser Colgrave in, in his statement uh, for Pocono Village provided a summary of the capacity across those parcels of land and estimated in the order of 7,000 dwellings could be supplied to the market. Uh, of that applied a, a theoretical um, yield per hectare of dwellings. I've had a look at the main developments uh, that comprise that amount of land. And in my view, um, it equates to around 4,000 dwellings. And that looks at the actual development plans for those sites. So I think that's more of an actual estimate rather than a theoretical estimate. So I set it around 4,000. Uh, and then of that, I wouldn't expect it all to come to the market over the next 10 years. Um, and I agree with Dr. Davies in that regard that um, perhaps in the order of 60, 70% of that can be expected to come to the market um, over the next 10 year period because there are always unforeseen reasons why developments don't go ahead. And I outlined some of the reasons in my evidence for that. Um, so I think a conservative approach in that regard is, is, is helpful. Um, one, one of the key aspects um, in, in terms of understanding um, how much uh, will be supplied to the market and the price of that dwelling, uh, of those dwellings that are supplied to the market is, is the number of players in the market. So historically, Pocono's had one developer, Pocono Village, uh, one main developer, I should say. Uh, and with the various proposals, I see an opportunity for, for several um, medium to large developments coming to the market. That'll create a fair amount of competition, both in terms of price and product diversity. And uh, there'll be a lot of marketing from each of those developments if they go ahead. And I think that'll put Pocono on the map more and that will in turn increase uh, demand for, for Pocono. So I think having three or four players in the market is, is critical to an efficient housing market. And that's a big part of the consideration in terms of how the market works rather than just looking purely at the number of houses that can be supplied. Um, if, you, if you put it all into one uh, developer's um, uh, basket, then it's unlikely that they will sell sections as quickly as they otherwise uh, would need to if there was a bit of competition in the market. Uh, just quickly in terms of employment, uh, this is an issue that's, that's popped up. Um, in my view, it's, it's reasonably straightforward to consider. Uh, there is industrial land that has been identified um, as a potential location. Um, the 2070 document, there's no reason why that can't be zoned um, as it's required. I think in the meantime, there's um, su sufficient employment opportunity uh, within 30 minutes of the site. And, um, and then over time, I expect um, Pocono will have some more employment opportunities. It's a great location for businesses, obviously very central to Hamilton, uh, Tauranga and Auckland is actually the central point of all population in the top half of the North Island, which is, is really why some firms find it quite an attractive location. So I expect that will support employment opportunities. Um, yeah, that's probably all I wanted to run through. So I'm happy to uh, take questions. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Um, Mr. Fulton, please. Yeah, no, I don't have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Ms. Gibb? <coughs> No questions, thank you. Mr. Ahol? No questions from me, thank you. Uh, Ms. Cedric? Oh, nothing, thank you. Mr. Cooney? Um, no, and I suppose you can't do your pricing until um, you start the work if, if this is granted. Um, but I was interested in your comments about um, um, 
Pocono Village, uh, they started off, what did you say, around about 600, was it, a couple of years ago? Uh, in 2002, they, they started approximately, um, sorry, 2012, uh, and they, uh, I guess in their first um, strong year of sales, had around 50 or 60 dwellings sold per annum. Um, possibly slightly less than that, um, 40 or 50, assuming some would be other dwellings in, in Pocono that are being built outside their development. And then over time, that's increased year on year. So that graph really shows that as development gets bigger, it goes from strength to strength in terms of its sale rate. And that's very common to these large developments because buyers can see what they're getting into and, and they, um, they have the amenities established in the developments, such as parks and schools and shops, which make it more attractive to buyers and that's really where these big developments get an edge in the market. Some figures of a couple of years ago, those, those um, the price figures were around about 600, is that right? You, you did produce some figures somewhere. That, that's right, um, in the six to $700,000 range, as, as little as 18 months ago, um, you could buy a, a three and four bedroom family house um, a good sized house, 180 square meters on a 600 square meter site. So um, certainly a, a very attractive form of housing um, and, and, and quite affordable for a first home buying household. And the primary market for those were first young first home buyers with families and moving down from central and east Auckland in particular, that they account for 70, 80% of the buyers. So um, really um, people that couldn't otherwise afford to buy a, a good family house, we were able to buy one in, in Pocono. Um, obviously since then, the price of housing has jumped up quite quickly in Auckland and in the Waikato, um, by, by over $100,000 in the last year and a bit. Uh, and what's really driving that is the, the shortage, the, the historic shortage, um, as I mentioned, 45,000 shortage in Auckland region and 8,000 in the Waikato. And, um, these district plan reviews are really paying catch up to try and get on top of that, um, on, on top of that issue. Um, but yeah, at the moment, nothing under 800,000 for a family home in, in Pocono. I would expect if there were two or three new developments and there was more diversity of products, so some smaller houses, townhouses, terrace houses, etc., cetera, uh, that they would come into the market in the six to $700,000 range. Um, given the current pricing, and I certainly think that would be in the community's interest if that was available. Uh, where you do have multiple developments um, competing in one location, such as Red, Red Hills in West Auckland, uh, you, you get competition um, in terms of the type of product that the developers bring to the market and also price, um, as I mentioned. And what's happened in that uh, area is there's been more townhouses and a few terrace houses thrown into the bigger conventional standalone um, type housing developments. So that would be my expectation um, if, if these two uh, properties are uh, approved for development, you would see a wider mix of housing than is currently available uh, in Pocono Village, which is very much just a standard uh, suburban scale subdivision. And along with that, you would have lower prices. And I think that's the, that's that's quite important in terms of meeting that demand in that $580,000 and under price range, which the district is, is quite correctly pointed out where the demand lies. Um, and I, I would note that the council hasn't put forward any uh, specific strategy to address that central issue um, in terms of how to provide housing for under $580,000. And with regard to the national policy statement, that's where the demand comes from. Uh, so that's where the demand is. So I certainly um, would support any development that, that enables that. You think with the development costs we could reduce at that price? That was the earlier question. Yeah, sorry. Um, Peter's just asked me to comment on the development costs. Well, if, if you're building a $650,000 house, that gives you roughly $300,000 or $325,000 for the lot price in terms of what uh, the developer would need to realise um, to then in turn... Um, allow a builder to supply that house to the market at 650000 So for a $325,000 lot, uh, you're looking normally at around $100,000 to $120,000 worth of development costs, um, of which forty, fifty thousand dollars or so would be for the civil works. Um, even if you had quite an extreme um, uh, site 
in terms of civil works, you wouldn't normally exceed 80, 90, dollars $100,000. So in total, you'd still be only at the high $100,000 to develop that lot, um, including all your contributions and, and other costs. So that would certainly um, still be feasible in the market, in my view, um, to deliver sections in the, in the 300 to 325 thousand dollar range and just just for context that was the price of sections um 18 months 24 months ago when prices were um six hundred and fifty thousand dollars for the end house value so yes certainly i don't see that as as an issue given for these sites for these sites um, it would need to be a, a a very unusually difficult uh site in terms of civil works to not be feasible at three hundred and twenty five thousand dollars for a lot okay Thanks very much. Thanks for that. Just one from me, Mr. Thompson, and it's if you look at the, I mean, I understand what you've said about the, the housing market generally, I think. I think that's fairly clear. Um, but in terms of Pocono itself functioning as, as a, I don't know what you want to call it, but as an entity of itself, as opposed to providing people that can live in Pocono and drive to Penrose or Hamilton or the base or somewhere like that. Have you looked at how the, the residential offering cumulatively interacts with the commercial zoning and industrial zoning on site, on, in the locality? And I have it and I, I, th I think there, there's certainly capacity in the town centre for it to expand to provide for the retail and, and office requirements for, uh, for, for the town. It's recently uh, had a supermarket and supermarkets normally require 4,000 dwellings or so to work. So uh, you can see that that supermarket's come in relatively early. Uh, you won't need another one for a little while. Uh, normally you would have another... 40 or 50 stores on top of that, which is um, certainly achievable. It'd be possibly half that at the moment there. So I don't see any issue with the commercial and office side. Uh, in terms of the industrial, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, I, I, I note the, the, the 2070 document has a location for industrial. Um, that, in, that, that would be more than able to provide that type of employment opportunity locally as required. Uh, and um, in the meantime, um, towns such as Pocono often have quite a few tradesmen that will uh, purchase a house there, perhaps build their own house there and then work from that location. So you do have the employment that um, goes along with the construction of the town, which is quite significant, uh, obviously. And, um, and that's, that's reasonably obvious when you have a drive around, you can see how many... Uh, tradesmen's cars there are parked outside the front of, of many of the houses so I think that in the in the short to medium term would would support some some local employment opportunities but I, I think um, certainly there'll be a need to rezone some industrial land there at some point um, perhaps five or ten years away um, in the meantime um, even if you achieve the higher growth rates of you know three four hundred dwellings per annum um, you're only talking over a five-year um, period, you know, a few thousand dwellings. So um, it's not it's not a huge quantity of workers that would need to um, find work over that period of time. So I think there's you know there's there's not quite the rush um, that may may be suggested for it. And perhaps one further comment would be you, you would possibly want to make a decision on how much industrial land is is appropriate after deciding on how much residential is appropriate. Um, so um, whilst they go hand in hand, um, you know, understanding what that, that level of growth that's expected there over the next 10 years would, would then provide the basis for understanding how much um, industrial land may be worthwhile. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks for that answer. Thanks for your evidence, Mr. Thompson. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'd like to call Will Moore to come and do his <coughs> summary statement and address questions. So this is basically on infrastructure and particularly the um, stormwater situation, which obviously has been raised as an issue. 
Uh, good morning, everybody. Morning. I just thought it would be best to uh, talk through the high level uh, servicing strategy for the site to begin. And I just wanted to refer everybody to the engineering report and the drawings appended to that report. Do you have a copy of that? You can immediately, if you want to show it to us, um, if it's a report, it's probably easier for you to find it than me. We can bring it up, sir. Um, James Thank is... You. I mean, I've got the evidence statements here, but it's... Um, we'll, we'll, we'll share the screen. I, I'd prefer if you were able to do it than me. Recording in progress. Sure what, sure what that was. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, it was me. me. I'm, tr I'm having difficulties with my computer. I've had to go into another screen. Sorry, should be okay now. Okay, thank you. No, that's fine. It was, there was some horrible feedback there for a minute, but looks like we're okay. On page uh, 22. Page 22. So can the panel see that report now? Yes, thank you. Great. Maybe get rid of the bars. Talk you get... Uh, I think you have, yeah, the one on the left, that's better. Could you make it, if you could just make it ever so slightly bigger, just click on the plus button at the top. If you can clear some of the toolbars from the screen. Yeah, I don't know that you can anymore, but <laughs> that, that's, I think that's okay. Can the panel read that okay? Yeah. Yeah, I think we can follow that. Thank you. Okay, so Maven has uh, undertaken this plan, uh, which basically outlines the stormwater strategy for the site. So the site's been broken down into a number of sub catchments, and those catchments have got the allocated hectares in the table on the left. And we've done some high level stormwater modeling to understand uh, what size ponds, stormwater ponds would be required for each catchment. So the site's split into seven catchments. Uh, we've got six large ponds there, and we've shown addictively where these ponds could be located on the site. Uh, these ponds will provide um, water sensitive design for stormwater. They'll provide stormwater uh, quality treatment, and they'll also provide stormwater attenuation of the two 10 and 100 year storm events. Um, this will basically uh, achieve a stormwater solution on the site, which would prevent any downstream effects in terms of uh, flooding and any increased flows to uh, uh, Waikato River or any of its tributaries. Um, obviously, this still needs to be worked through um, in more detail, and we understand the comments um, from the submitters, but we think we've done enough investigation here to show a solution that is feasible and achieves stormwater servicing of the site. James, if you could just scroll down to the next page. Um, so the ponds here are shown um, with their sizing. Uh, it's just noted that these ponds will be located outside flood zones. Um, and we've also shown how uh, stormwater networks would uh, connect into these ponds. It's envisaged that these ponds would store uh, flows from rain events and then discharge to the stream which runs through the site. And again, this will prevent any increase um, in flooding to downstream uh, properties. James, if we could just scroll down to page uh, 28. So in terms of wastewater, it's envisaged that um, there'll be a centralized pump station located at the low point of the site. Um, it's envisaged that networks will uh, discharge their flow to this pump station. Uh, we've, had, we've been in discussions with Waikato District Council in terms of where this pump station will discharge to. It can either go straight onto Pocono Road um, and join into the existing rising main, 
or it could pump back to the town center where there's another pump station already existing. And then this flow uh, ultimately pumps all the way to the Pocono uh, treatment plant, which it has been confirmed that this has capacity uh, for the district from our site. So just to note, the flows that are associated with wastewater from residential activities are relatively low um, in terms of other activities. So the industrial activities, which are located to the east of our site, uh, discharging far greater flows than our residential uh, development is. Waikato District Council have confirmed that they don't see any issue in servicing our site in the future. Um, and they are currently working on solutions, which are to form part of their future projects to include the wastewater discharge from our site. If we just go down to uh, water supply, which is on page 31. So in terms of water supply, again, we've shown how a network uh, could service the site. There's currently a large existing bulk main uh, of large diameter just to the east. And it's proposed that a simple extension of this up to our site would provide the bulk feed to our site and that we would run further extensions through the residential development to achieve servicing of water supply. So I just wanted to talk through those three key servicing strategies to start, um, just to show to the panel that we have thought a lot about servicing and we have investigated in a high level of detail for both stormwater, wastewater and water supply. We have been liaising with those uh, Waikato District Council and Waikato Regional Council over the last few years. And we've been working on these strategies together and we've had basically confirmation from both that um, they believe also that these strategies are feasible and will allow the live zoning of this land. I just wanted to talk to um, a couple of the issues brought up from the submitters also. So as Peter Fuller previously mentioned, um, the submitters do agree that servicing can be achieved for the site, including stormwater. However, the key issues were when the detailed modeling should be undertaken and whether or not that should be undertaken prior to the plan change or after the plan change. And specifically, they talked about the size of the stormwater ponds and how much land they would take up and also the location of those ponds and if that would cause any issues. Their main concern was there is that if stormwater ponds are located in the downstream catchments, then these can often attenuate flows and release them later, which coincide with other peak flows from upper catchments. So I just wanted to address those points briefly as well. So as previously mentioned, we believe that we've done sufficient stormwater modeling to confirm that um, stormwater management is achievable on our site. In terms of sizing, um, the submitters suggest that to achieve stormwater mitigation, this could take up to six hectares of land. Uh, we've had a look at this. Obviously we have sized our ponds so we know how much the pond size will be within our land. We also note that our site itself is less than 25% of the overall catchment, which they refer to. And so the size of our ponds is far less than the six hectares suggested. And the other key point is that our site is located in the upper um, catchment of the overall stream catchment. And therefore, the risk of coinciding peak flows um, is very low because we're in the upper catchment. Um, also, just in terms of wastewater and water supply, um, these upgrades are in the 10 year plan at the moment. And as I previously mentioned, uh, we've been talking to Waitato District Council over the last number of years to confirm that they can service our site in terms of wastewater and water supply. 
I just also wanted to quickly address um, Linda's previous comments, talking about the health and well-being of the Waikato River. Uh, the key point there is that we can actually control um, the hundred-year flood within our site, including climate change, and therefore there would be no increase in flow from our site post-development. So everything on our site will be stormwater neutral and there'll be no increased flow um, after our site is developed and therefore we shouldn't have any uh, adverse effects on the Waikato River. That was pretty much what I wanted to address to the... All right, thanks, thanks Mr Moore. Let's see if the panel do have any questions for you. Let's start with Mr Fulton, please. No, I think that's quite clear. Um, I think you've illustrated clearly to me that um, it can be managed, so I'm happy about that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Tiaho? Thank you for that. <clears throat> um, um, so in terms of your comment, just that last comment, and I've just been reading back through your evidence, um, that, there'd be, that there would be no adverse effects, that it would be stormwater neutral. The vision and strategy actually requires restoration and protection. So in the cases do, do um, say that a, an element of betterment is required. So um, can you speak to whether what's being proposed actually creates some form of betterment? Yes, yes, I can. So just an neutral mitigating. Um, yes. So what we have um, further up in the report, we talk about what we're doing in terms of betterment. So what we want to do is we want to protect the streams which are currently um, in, in the site. So we're going to do that by basically maintaining the low flows in the streams and also replanting a lot of the stream um, which is currently of low ecological value. Um, when we do more detailed stormwater modeling as well, when, when the stormwater catchment plan or management plan is undertaken, if it is seen that there is downstream flooding issues, one way to uh, prevent that or, or make that better is we can actually over attenuate. So what we're saying is at the moment is that we have proposed to attenuate to pre-development flows, but we can actually over attenuate so that our flows will be less than what is currently at pre-development. So if there are concerns with downstream flooding, which will be uh, investigated and determined under the SMP, then there is that option basically to um, yeah, decrease flows less than pre-development levels. The question may have been directed also at quality as well as quantity in terms of flood flows. So would you like to maybe yeah. just address quality aspects, particularly non-point source um, pollution from dairy or from farming, for example, versus what will be the situation here where we're restoring all of the waterways, planting repairing areas, fencing off bush and that sort of thing. Have you yeah, got a comment yeah. on that? So in terms of betterment? Yeah, in terms of betterment and stormwater quality. So the use of wetlands throughout the development are gonna are going to treat stormwater to a very, very high level, 75% removal of suspended solids. Um, that's going to create a nice natural feature to the development, but also um, basically have stormwater um, uh, cleaner than is currently on site. So at the moment, um, you know, as Peter uh, said, there's, there's grazing, there's stock. Um, there is no control of, of the stormwater. It's probably highly likely that there's erosion and there's sediment which is also uh, running downstream. Once we put in ponds which capture everything, all of that sediment actually drops out of the pond uh, to the bottom and then just the top surface water, which is the clean water, then is discharged to the, to the streams. And as we, as we talked about as well, those streams are going to be replanted and revegetated um, with margins. So. Thank you. Thank you, um, Ms. Tiaho. Um, Ms. Gibb? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Apologies for the earlier disruption. 
Um, right. I just have one question. Um, you talk. I'm really pleased you're talking with the council about their long-term plan and their work there. Um, I'm just wondering what year have they, or did they tell you what year the work was planned for within the 10-year plan? In terms of wastewater? Yes, that's right. Um, so when I last talked to them, um, which was fairly recently, they had some approved developments um, in terms of the industrial activities to the east. And so they had to basically provide wastewater for those. And that was as soon as possible. And they thought within the next few years that was all going to be sorted and that was going to align nicely with our residential development. So they had they basically told us that they had more pressing developments that they had to service and the servicing of our um, residential small amount of discharge was not going to be an issue by the time this was live zoned. So that was oh, it. So good. So it looks like it might, um, the timing might be just perfect. Yeah, that's correct. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Sedgwick? Uh, thank you, yes. Can you tell me um, what, um, I understand your discussion before about attenuation, but what impact has climate change had um, or projected climate change on your modelling, please? Yes, um, so, sorry, I'm not sure if I mentioned that. So all the pond sizing takes into account climate change. So that is uh, a, a statutory requirement of the code. So when we do our calculations, for post-development, we have to include that with climate change included. And I think it's a 13.3% increase or, or something along, along those lines that we have to allow for. So okay. climate change is um, part of our standard requirements for the sizing of the wetlands. And um, adding to the climate change, of course, is, is the natural uh, wet nature of Pocono. Thank you very much. I have no more questions. Thank you. Mr. Cooney? Um, <clears throat> Pocono Village, um, their original stance, I think, and I, I'm not sure whether they've changed their, <clears throat> their position, but <clears throat> they, I think they've said to us before, or in their evidence, that they looked at the site for development but it was just too hard. And one of the main considerations was the stormwater issues that, that arose from trying to develop it. What, what's your, if that's still their position, then what's your um, response to that? I think that we've investigated the site and we have found that the site is large enough to encompass um, stormwater um, devices which can address stormwater concerns. We have had to obviously put aside an amount of land to achieve this. Um, and some of those areas you know, could have been primed for developing, but I think that we've shown that this is achievable. Um, one of the other concerns might've been that there is you know, an existing overland flow path through the site um, and associated flooding. But again, I think we've seen these as opportunities and really looked at enhancing these areas rather than looking at them as something that's gonna stop development. So I think that through our analysis, we, we would um, disagree with that statement and say that stormwater modeling can be achieved for this site. Yeah, and I think you responded to one of the commissioners, you said that stormwater would be neutral. I read somewhere where you were trying to achieve a, an 80 percent less discharge under your development than what currently occurs is that can you just clarify what threshold you're looking at there yeah so that was discussed previously so um and one of the other questions at the moment we've just looked at a hundred percent pre to post so that our, the pre-development flow and the post-development flow would be the same however um, by slightly increasing the pond size, we could actually say that we we're only 80% of what, of what was previously there. Um, I think that the detailed 
or more detailed modeling can be undertaken and will be undertaken um, post subdivision <coughs> consent. At this stage, we've just basically shown an example whereby we think that stormwater modeling is achievable and this would be the approximate location and the sizes of devices to achieve that. What, what does the um, council's uh, code of practice require in terms of stormwater discharges? Is it 80% is it or what? It depends, it depends Paul, on if there is downstream issues um, or, or not, so identified or not. So some areas which there's no in downstream flooding emissions or no in downstream constraints may ask for that. However, the, the, the most common type is just pre to post development. Um, so that's what we've modeled, modeled in this situation. Um, under the SP, if it is found that there are some downstream concerns, then, then that modeling can be looked at. But the standard is pre to post, uh, not, not more than that. Okay, thank you. Do you have any comment to make? I mean, I, I understand the, the stormwater neutrality, which is essentially all about limiting peak flows such that the size of the pipes that are already in existence don't need to be expanded upon and so forth. But what effect would, would the, would the um, increase in impervious areas have in terms of the duration of flood events, for example, as opposed to the peak flows? And it, is that something that we need to consider at this stage? By providing the by providing the ponds, um, all of the additional volume. So, so there is more volume, which is going to come off our site. But those ponds hold that volume. So no, no, I understand. I understand that. But then it's got to be released, and it's got to be released in time to enable it to be available for when it rains again. And yeah. and what I'm wondering is whether the interaction of the overall hydrograph in the lower part of the catchment has whether what you're proposing has any implications for that. So it may not increase the peak flood levels downstream, but it may increase their duration, especially in extreme events. And I'm just wondering to what extent that might be relevant and if you've considered it. I think um, it relates to um, what one of the submitters was saying about having the coinciding peak flows. So what, what the industry looks at there is that if you're in a lower part of the development, if you, if you have ponds like what you're saying, Phil, and they release flows over time, and those flows actually coincide with flows which are coming naturally off upstream um, catchments, then they will just at the same time, and then you have an increased flow. So those concerns usually are only raised when you have um, stormwater attenuation ponds in the lower catchment. For this example, we're actually up in the upper catchment. So the idea is that we won't actually release our flows until stormwater from the lower catchment has already passed through and gone downstream. And then because we're in the upper catchment and we're holding back flows, ours will then come later. What they don't want to do, or what we don't want to do in the industry is have ponds downstream so that when these flows are coming from upstream naturally, we then hold that back and then they coincide at the same time and they increase, they have an increase in the volume like what you're talking about. And so that was a concern raised and the sort of industry rule of thumb is that you don't have ponds in the lower third or lower half of the catchment, but we are in the upper half or the upper third of the catchment. So we don't think that that volume um, will have a negative effect downstream. The reason I'm raising this is that I've had a number of dealings in other parts of the countries on exactly this issue. And the question of not just the peaks and not just the points that you have raised, but that they're saying that even though the hydrograph in the lower part of the catchment may be receding, there's still a need to discharge from these ponds at some point. I mean, it doesn't sit there for weeks and months. And as a consequence of that, the combination of the falling limb of the downstream hydrograph plus the increment that you're providing means that flooding in the lower catchment is still increased and has a greater duration 
than what it is in under the status quo situation. That begs the question of whether that causes any effects or not. And, and I take that point. But in those cases, people often make the argument that says, well, there's higher flows for longer downstream, it increases erosion, it increases maintenance costs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm just wanting to give you every opportunity to clarify that to the, to the extent that you can, please. Um, I, Phil, I, I've come across this argument as well many times um, in, in the past. And basically the answers are still the same as what we're saying. Like the industry rule of thumb is, is always about the peak flow and, and the flow, the queue. We do understand what you're saying there. There would be more volume of water. But in this instance, I think because we're providing these ponds, which are taking that additional volume and we're releasing <laughs> over an extended period of time and we're in the upstream catchment that um, for anybody downstream or, or any effects downstream, I think we've mitigated those as best as possible to the industry standard. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's all we can really say on that. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moore. I have no further questions. Thanks for your evidence. Can I just have one more question? Just on the um, the management of the releasing of the water from the ponds, um, say in 10 years time, for instance, whose responsibility is it to manage or who will be responsible for the management of the water flow from the ponds? So those ponds will be public, public assets. So they will be vested to Waikato District Council and then uh, maintenance of those Will be will fall to council. Um, however, for wetlands themselves, um, maintenance maintenance isn't too onerous. So, um, again, as we talked about, we're looking at making these ponds or wetlands into something that um, increases the aesthetics of the site. Um, it's, it's somewhere where people can go and walk around, uh, maybe have a picnic at. So. Um, they will, be, they will be public ponds, and they do fall back to um, council to maintain. Um, but, but again, that is standard. So still more. So they're vested in council, effectively, are they? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, thank you. On that, um, Mr. Chair, um, on the discussion you've just had um, with with, um, with with this person, um, expert. Um, is, is it also um, an issue to address that, um, what you've just discussed? Is it a question of um, capacity in, in terms of, of the volume that can be retained? Sorry, uh, what was the question there, Paul? Um, in terms of the duration effect of these ponds, Another component, the ability to retain the water for longer periods? Yes, yes, we can do that. So basically, we can make the orifice or the overflow smaller and, the, and, and then the pond size will get bigger. So we've sized it at the moment just to match pre-development and that can be um, less than pre-development um, or we can make the ponds bigger to store more volume like we discussed. Um, at the moment, we've just done it to the industry standard. And I think once the stormwater management plan is completed, that will give a better indication of exactly um, what those requirements would be. Okay, thank you. Very good. Thank you very much, Mr. Moore. Thank you, thank you Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Moore. And I suppose the main purpose of that exercise is to prove that a solution can be found, but there will be some detail working through with the council as the catchment management plan is prepared in terms of the consenting stage and what actually the final design would be, um, particularly in terms of some of those issues further downstream. So thanks for that. Um, we've now got a, a, a group of sort of design type people. So I'll call Mr. Pryor um, to do the broader sort of landscape overview. And then we'll go down into the more detailed urban designers, which is Mr. Munro and then Mr. Ho for CSL. Um, Thank you. 
So we'll start with Mr. Pryor to do the landscape issue, and he will be addressing the, the 100 RL um, matter that has been raised. So is there any particular plan you'd like to start with? Um, I think we'll try and drive things from, from here. But James, can you bring up Rob's uh, yep. plans? Thank you. Is that viewpoint, site and viewpoint location? The viewpoint location, man. Yep. <laughs> Did you want the mouse, Rob? Um, no, I'll just tell you when to move on. So that's visible to the panel, is it? That? Uh, yeah, but yes, it is. It's pretty small, though. So if you could perhaps bump it up a bit, that would be good. Yeah, that's, that's much better, even if it means moving the figure up and down a bit. I think that's much easier, Red. Thanks. Thanks, Ron. Okay. Good morning, Mr. Chair and, and panel. Morning. Welcome, Mr. Pryor. Thank you. Um, yeah, so obviously on the on the screen at the moment, um, you're very familiar with the, the site and its um, location and its um, link within the work to the existing uh, urban Pocono area. Um, I think the, the key issue for this hearing uh, from a landscape and visual perspective is in relation to the RL100 um, figure and um, the fact that development should not be occurring uh, above that. Um, as we're all aware, uh, I note that it wasn't rolled through to the operative plan uh, at the time of the Pocono structure plan um, or carried through to the proposed district plan um, I'll also note that the landforms in the surrounding Pocono uh, Basin um, were not or have not been identified um, as outstanding natural landscapes. Um, in terms of development occurring above that um, R0100, and particularly in relation to this hearing, um, I consider that appropriate mechanisms have been taken into account um, with the indicative concept plan uh, to ensure the retention of the rural backdrop and the protection of the ridgeline. Um, as you'll hear a little bit later on uh, from Ms Shanks, uh, the enhancement of the stream corridors, uh, the ecological enhancements, planting in the gullies and of the slopes in riparian areas will significantly enhance the landscape values and ecological values of the, of the site. In terms of the country uh, CLZ zoned land uh, above that RL um, 100, um, additionally, there are the landscape character and amenity provisions within the district plan relating to um, landscape character and amenity, building height, uh, building coverage, earthworks, uh, and amenity values. In relation to what Sir William uh, was referring to this morning, uh, I'm also very supportive of the EPA approach um, for the countryside living zone, uh, which would have significant ecological and landscape benefits. Um, and in my view, from a, a landscape perspective, the outcome would be far superior uh, than just retaining the rural uh, and degraded slopes above the RL100 uh, in their current form. Just in relation to that RL100 from a, a landscape architect's perspective, I do have difficulty in that an arbitrary um, RL of 100 uh, was applied to, to the entire Pocono Basin area, not based on any significant landscape features or elements within, within the area. And from a landscape perspective, I do find it difficult that that figure of 100 is, is just applied and Visually, from my point of view, um, 
it, it just doesn't make sense to, to say no development is acceptable above that 100 line. And I think the, the idea of the um, EPA uh, approach or, or other similar approaches um, will give a, a far superior outcome than strictly um, restricting development to a 100 um, RL throughout the entire Pocono Basin. So happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Pryor. Let's see how we go on questions. Can we start with you, please, Ms. Gibb? No, I had no questions, thank you. Ms. Sedgwick? Uh, thank you, yes. Yesterday, um, we heard a lot from submitters um, about Pocono being in a basin and having um, identifiable ridge lines around it. Uh, and we heard that also from the um, iwi submitters. And I wondered if you might have a have a comment on uh, or what your thoughts are. Uh, Mr. Fuller, I think, talked about um, uh, that um, the view coming south, um, and it was not just coming south, but also that um, uh, my my contention is or my question is for people in Pocono looking up, um, would they reasonably expect to see a um, consistent ridge line. I'm interested in your thoughts on that. So I think if we take the um, wider Pocono environs and, and you will be hearing from me again tomorrow, particularly in relation to, to Havelock Village, um, and that the, the Havelock Village landform is in quite a, has quite a different um, landscape character in that we do have Transmission Hill, um, which is a, a from my point of view, a significant landscape feature. And we also um, have the Potter Hill. Um, and, and so I think it's, it, it makes perfect sense to pick up on um, significant landscape features, even if they're not significant in, in the true sense of the way, and retain them free of development rather than just picking a, a line and saying no development should occur above 100. Um, in terms of the Pocono West and CSL land, um, we have the Ridge Road ridge line, which does extend up to around about 150 um, RL. Uh, we don't have the same landforms that we do on, on, the, on the Havelock site and that there aren't any um, prominent knolls or, or, or ridges there but other than the ridge road um, ridge line that the, the, the road sort of runs along. So it's a, a different landscape in the west than, than we do have in the east. Okay, that, that's a useful point. Thank you. And I wanted to also just finally, if you wanted to comment on um, the statement Mr Fuller made, um, it it would look better than the existing landscape pasture. Is that um, seems quite a subjective um, opinion? I'm interested in your comments on that. Well, so certainly with the um, the EPA approach, I mean those those upper slopes are quite degraded and, and steep, um, and to to have them planted up with sensitive um, dwellings uh, clustered within significant planting um, from a landscape perspective is a, is a far superior outcome than degraded pastoral slopes. Okay, I have no more questions. Thank you very much for your answers. Thank you. Mr. Fulton? Yeah, no, I have no questions. Thank you very much. Ms. Tiaho? No, thank you. I would have asked the same question that um, Commissioner Cedric asked. Thank you. Mr. Kearney? Oh, no. Commissioner Cedric's um, question there. Um, we're, we're not here, we're not dealing with significant landscapes, are we? We're dealing with a rural type backdrop to Pocono, which has been observed up, up to date. So, so that in itself has a landscape uh, or character value, doesn't it? Would you agree with that? 
Yes, well, yeah, we're, we're certainly not talking about any significant landscape landforms. Um, they are encircling um, hill slopes, um, and you know, they, they do not go to any significant height. I mean, obviously, we've got Ridge Road going up to 150, and from memory, Transmission Hill goes to around about 125 RL. So they are they are quite minor landforms in, in comparison to other uh, outstanding natural landscapes. Um, probably a little bit of intrigue as to your argument about, uh, well, as compared to what currently exists as a rural backdrop, um, by allowing houses in and replanting areas, that will improve the situation. Um, how, how do you reach that point? Well, uh, th to me, that's in, in comparison to having a, a line of houses um, built up to that 100 RL line, um, which would effectively, um, as you looked around the, the basin, you would see built development purely going up to 100 and the probability, well, possibility of uh, all of those roof lines going up to that maximum uh, point. And then beyond that would be the, uh, the rural, rural zoned land with uh, pasture behind it. As I mentioned earlier, from a, from a landscape um, character and amenity perspective, um, I think a superior outcome would be achieved by planting up those uh, slopes um, with the allowance of sensitively um, integrated dwellings within those plantings. Have you got any uh, uh, photo montages or anything like that to give us an idea as to the uh, difference? Uh, no, I haven't in this, in this case. Okay. All right, thank you. Just to take that a, a, a step further, um, Mr. Pryor, and, and maybe I know you don't have any photo montages, but you do have various photographs from various viewpoint locations. Yes, if we can um, have a look at. And, and what what are, while you're when you when you're speaking to that, Mr. Mead concluded that the maintenance of a rural backdrop was important. And I think that's the primary um, reason why he's not in favor of the zoning or the rezoning above 100 meters RL. So could you talk about when, when you're referring to the, to the photographs or photograph or photographs that you're going to refer to, just talk to us about the rural backdrop and what the effects of it might be and whether that's beneficial or not in the circumstances? Yes, I think if we can refer to this viewpoint one, and I'll take you through a couple of others um, on the on the screen. We haven't got the viewpoint um, location map in front of us. So you'll just, if you can just take a little bit of time to orientate us and tell us where you are and what, what we're actually looking okay, at. Okay, so the, the viewpoint one is, um, Taken from Helensley Road, looking directly uh, west. Yeah, okay, uh, looking up, up the hill. Okay, the, up towards the Ridge Road. Yeah, okay, thank you. So we can we can see uh, in that viewpoint the the, the Ridge Road um, ridge line, and, and you can see that sort of quite convoluted nature, but also the extent of. Um, of, of that rural backdrop. The, obviously the, the, the land that we are talking about is only a component of, of that. And if we particularly look on the, the, the right-hand side um, of that view, you can see that very steep land going up towards the Ridge, uh, ridge Road. 
using the pointer. I so can just yeah. So uh, along along there, so you can see the convoluted nature and steepness of that um, of that landform. So uh, from that landscape perspective, rather than uh, just saying development should be restricted to 100 with um, pasture land behind that. What I'm saying is, is that from a landscape perspective, um, visually, ecologically, uh, and from a landscape basis, by planting up those slopes um, and allowing development within that uh, indigenous planting, um, a superior outcome would be achieved rather than just um, potentially some quite degraded um, rural pasture land. Could you, could you just, just to help interpret this, could you just sort of very crudely mark out the various property boundaries with the cursor, just so that we can be clear where it is we're supposed to be looking? I mean, I know, I know broadly speaking, but if you could just delineate the boundaries between uh, the Munro block to the extent that we can see that, and the CSL land, where the 100 metre contour is, those sorts of things, just to orientate ourselves clearly. Uh, James, can you? Oh. <laughs> it's all right, it's just useful to see the viewpoint map to see where I mean, I know I can see them on the viewpoint map. I want to, I want to understand where they are on this <laughs> viewpoint. So in, in, in terms of the CSL and top um, top end yes. uh, property on, on obviously the, the right hand side of yes um, where the curse where the cross is yes and and just in relation to that map that we had this morning with approximately half of that um, CLZ land my understanding is that um, Ridge Road in the the west, the, the highest part of Ridge Road is around about here, yes. and that's around about 150. Yes. Um, where CSL and Top End is, it extends to a height of around about 125 RL. So yes. we would effectively be uh, 25 metres below that ridge line um, at that RL 100 line. So, what RL are we at where we're standing, where that photo's taken? Uh, I wouldn't be entirely sure, sorry. Because it doesn't look like we're looking up at all. It almost looked from where we're standing. I mean, maybe that's just an artifact of the, the lens and the way the, monta the um, photograph's been stitched together. Yes, no, I'd, I'd say we were um, quite a... Quite a bit below. That's it. That is. Um, because it's not. It's the 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 photograph's not that helpful because it's not giving us any sense of rural backdrop at all. As I mean, I, I suspect that's not what our eye would be seeing if we were standing there. In fact, it's not because we've stood on that point ourselves, albeit some time ago, and yeah. had a and had a good look. So, and that's no criticism of what's there. I know it's been produced for, uh, you know, for not not for this purpose, but. Yes, I'm really and that, looking for you to help me with this. Yes, that, that's the difficulty of a panorama which was stitched together with approximately eight to ten photographs yeah. to get yeah, that, that panorama. This understood. particular viewpoint here um, gives a, a little bit more of um, a feeling for the for the CSL land, and again that that backdrop um, up to to the Ridge Road um, Ridge Line. John. Can you just go back to the photograph viewpoint one? Do you want me to just discuss like that in the house is below the hundred, but it's visible because it's white and grey. Yeah. The importance of design and visually recessive colours. Just going back to to the the whole EPA um, <clears throat> concept, um, you know what is clear from this from this viewpoint. Here is, is your, your typical um, rural dwelling um, with no uh, controls on uh, colour or, or design. 
obviously one of the key aspects of um, built development within an EPA area would be the, the building design guidelines um, in addition to what provisions, landscape and, and landscape character and amenity provisions are already within the district plan. So while uh, EPA development would include um, built, built structures, um, they would be certainly visually recessive and sensitively integrated into the indigenous plantings. How hard would it be to produce from whatever the most appropriate viewpoint to look at this rural backdrop issue, and it may be one of the viewpoints that you've already selected, or it may be a different one, to actually produce a, a, a photo realistic landscape, you know, Institute of Landscape Architect consistent yes, no, that, that montage of, of, of what would happen to that yes. to, to that view if the if the if this land was developed in the way that you're intending it to be, that is with residential on the lower part of the property and country living in the top part. Because the challenge we've got is that we've got sort of pictures that aren't that aren't sort of photo accurate. And I don't mean any criticism of that. We're going to go to the site and have a look. We're going to have two different landscape architect views. We're going to have to try and piece together what we think is going to happen where, which is not altogether straightforward. So would it be possible for you to produce some sort of photo montage from an appropriate location or locations that gives us a very good feel for what this would look like at full development as proposed? Yes, that's um, that's entirely possible to to do. Um, if if um, you have a particular viewpoint location that you'd like, well, to, what, no, no, you're you're the expert. We want to we want sure. to we want to <laughs> understand. We want you to select it. Obviously, we would need to be mindful of ensuring if there were other parties that needed to look at that, they had the opportunity to comment. I don't know the extent to that to which that's. Uh, necessary here, but it may well be with um, with Tangata Fenua. I don't know, um, but I think in the first instance, if, if, if Mr. Fuller could advise us, um, perhaps after lunch, after he's had a chance to talk to you offline, the time frame that you envisage to do that, or, or whether you'd be prepared to do that. I, mean, I suppose that's the first question. And if so, what would be involved and how long it might take. Yes, no, we can certainly have a, a discussion about that. And I think in terms of a viewpoint location, um, potentially one um, further south, slightly further south from this viewpoint, looking right up towards, um, yeah, around about there, looking right up towards that um, ridge road, ridge line, um, encompassing that countryside living uh, slash EPA um, land above that uh, RL100 would be, would be very useful. I'll, I'll leave it to you to decide where the viewpoint is, but that's almost not a view that anybody that's already living or proposing to live in Pocono would see very often. That's a view that people accessing the property might look at. I'm, I'm just wondering, but won't but we'll leave it to you, that whether the issue that we're talking about here are the, are the wider views from further, from further away, like perhaps from the, the state highway or areas where people might stop the car and get out, not from necessarily within the village, but within there or within the Pocono town centre, sorry, within this area, but the more publicly observable um, locations, but I'll leave you to figure that out. It just seems to me that viewpoint one is sort of standing on the back of town, looking up at the new development in its standalone context, as a low, as opposed to being able to take that wider perspective of it. Yes, true, and we do. There, there is um, uh, that um, public park in um, in Hitchin. Hitchin Road, which is in that elevated location with the, the Norfolk Pines. And 
that would probably be quite a good location, um, being a very public We'll, place. we'll leave it to you to choose, but I think something, from my point of view at least, something that's that puts the view in context rather than looking at it at close range, which I seems to me viewpoint one or viewpoint three tends to do. It's really those, it, it may be that they're still appropriate, but it may be something that's a wider view from areas where the public at large might view this from, because that's the sense that I get about why maintaining the rural backdrop is seen as being important. It's not for the people that live in or close to the area necessarily, it's that wider appreciation of the area. Yes, and if I can take you to uh, that few people that I was talking about before. Uh, oh, yes, this one here. How do I get it? Oops. I'll scroll down. So this viewpoint six, uh, this was taken sort of right opposite that um, the, the public park uh, that's been set aside in, in Hitchin Road. So that, that's a view that um, that wider Pocono residential area sees looking out uh, up towards that ridge road, ridge line. So, so something like that may be useful to... As I say, we'll leave it to you, but it may be that more than one location potentially might be helpful. Certainly. Yeah. All right. If, and if Mr Fuller, if you could get back to us at some point during the day um, when you've had a chance to talk about uh, talk about this with Mr. Pryor in terms of whether whether your client and yourself are, are happy to run with that suggestion or or not, and if you are prepared to run with it, what you think the time frame and so forth might be that would help us. Yes, thank you for that, Mr. Chair. And um, the other two sort of design witnesses do have some comments as well. Mr. Munro did make one or two comments about some of this um, approach, and also Mr. Ho for CSL has done. He's got a um, perspective shot, but just, just in terms of taking instructions and clarification, is, is the panel wanting it to basically environment court evidence standards in terms of the montage or? Well, we're wanting something that's reliable. Yeah. And I would have thought the more reliable it is, the more quotes credible, close quotes it's going to be. Yeah. Um, but we're not going to say, I, I, and I would have thought that's, going to be the best way of doing it. Otherwise, you're going to get into an argument with somebody that says, well, it's, it doesn't conform to accepted standards, or you just yeah. throw it in the bin. Yep, no, that's fine. Um, just a bit of cost and time to obviously do that sort of work. But, well, no, but, and, but, and I appreciate that. That's why That's why we'll leave it to you to, to come back to us with a quotes proposal. Sure. You don't want to impose costs for the sake of it. But I think... You, you can tell from the questions that at least some of the panel are having some difficulty um, understanding how the photographs relate to Mr. Pryor's opinion. And we don't mean any criticism by saying that. Um, and I think we're saying that it's gonna help us to have a more definitive visual appreciation of what it is he's saying in his written text. Yes, and, and I suppose acknowledging also that from the you know from the proponent's perspective, we have been changing it slightly. Like the the environmental sort of clustered approach is something that's coming a bit later. So, yes, we didn't quite get the evidence to that point, but but happy to respond in a way with visual images that the right. panel and happy for you to revise that pr approach and consider it. You know, mm -hmm. after we've heard from Mr. Munro and Mr. Ho, because as yes. you say, they may help make this picture. No pun intended. Mr. Chair, we'd, we'd also um, we, we we need to give um, Ms. De Lambert the the right to comment. Yeah, I know. I, I think I mentioned that earlier. Certainly, we need to, we need to then think once you've decided what you can provide us, what process we need to follow to ensure that um, nobody's ambushed by that. Indeed, and and yes, and and I we can also explore whether, in fact, Ms., um, Mr. Lambert and. Mr. Pryor can sort of agree, for example, on some representative viewpoints. Well, I saying. think that would be, I mean, I think we'd encourage that as well. So yes. that's, that's helpful. Thank you. Yep. 
Very good. Thank you very much, Mr. Pry. Thank you. So thank you. We'll uh, um, <coughs> now call Mr. Munro to discuss urban design issues. So we're sort of drilling down a little bit more and he's mainly focused on, I think, the Munro block, but he did have some comments and thoughts about the other wider development as well, um, particularly around the 100 RL matter, because it does, there is a small part of the Munro block that I understand is affected by that um, contour line as well, although it's a fairly small part. Yes, all right, that's very good. Thank you very much. Welcome, Mr Munro. Thank you, sir. Hi, commissioners um, and spectators. Um, so as Mr Fuller said, I'm, I'm only uh, focusing really on that Munro block, open our West Limit land, and I wasn't part of preparing the original submission or the work that was undertaken. Uh, I was brought in as an independent reviewer after the submission had been lodged. So um, there are some things I can speak to. There are other things that I can only explain my interpretation of. No, that's fine. Thank you. Uh, so, so in terms of the urban design side of things, the, the Pocono Westland itself, I'd propose is at the less contentious end of all the matters before you. There's agreement with Mr. Mead uh, that the land is suitable for the residential zone. It was notified as such by the council. A handful of submissions and further submitters have raised uh, various technical issues. But as I've said in my evidence, sir, I haven't seen those as fundamentally questioning whether the land should be zoned, that they were questions of how. And, and those questions very quickly default to matters of the later subdivision consent and the many subdivision hurdles and questions and technical solutions that need to be found. Uh, so from my perspective, uh, I think the construct work was pretty robust. Uh, it does all the things I'd expect it to see. Um, the land they looked at was about 160 hectares. And once they'd completed all their analysis, they were left with around about 85, 86 or so hectares of land they felt could be developed. It's a little over 50%. Um, sounds really inefficient, I know, but um, by today's standards of protecting streams, uh, enhancing stream corridors, riparian areas and esplanades, uh, wetlands, and, and just providing a, a more connected block network that gives more of a site for roads than houses. Um, something between 55 and 60% is about right based on what I see for this sort of scale of development generally. So uh, that was another indicator to me that no shortcuts had been taken. And I think the panel can take some confidence that the representations of future development, such as were shown on the construct uh, master plan, Something like that, I think you can have confidence could be achieved on the site. Uh, and as I look at it, and I look at the outcomes that are sought in the PDP, particularly under chapter four, um, I'm not seeing any real risks that they're not going to be achieved. So um, moving onwards to the, the points of, of, I'd say minor disagreement, um, I, I didn't quite agree with some of Mr. Mead's analysis in support of uh, not looking to, to give more clarity on a small center or medium density zone at this time, but at the same time, I don't disagree with him that there is, of course, options to, to try and get something even better later on. So in the interest of just reducing the issues and trying to make your task a fraction of a percent easier, um, I, I plead no contest to that one, and I think we can all live with it. The question of the RL100, yeah, look, I, I don't have any landscape architecture views on that, sir, but, but what I'll say is that Growth's not a one-time thing that you just say, we've now done Pocono for the next 100 years, it's all over. We'll be here in 10 years doing the next plan, and we're already pushing right up against that RL100 line. So if you find it's worthy of protection, I think the inevitable conclusion is that this is where Pocono stops, unless it's just a temporary stop and you let it go next time. And so I look at it to say, well, where do you go? And the only argument for anywhere, and Mr. Lambert's acknowledged this, is to start pushing everything east of the motorway. That has major severance effects if you're trying to look at a, a connected, socially connected, convenient to get around, convenient for kids to visit each other's houses after school kind of environment. And as I see the evidence, sir, I think you're lacking a lot of technical analysis showing you can just keep putting houses in the east forever and a day. Uh, all the evidence is focused on the, on the western side, quite rightly, because that's where the questions are. So I'm not even sure at this point you could reach a conclusion that you've got a solution for growth in the long term by pushing east. I don't think that's been tested or proven yet. Uh, certainly not for the magnitude you'd need for the next 20, 30, 40 years of growth. 
And so it was that really first principles, high level picture that, that I looked at this RL100 from and said, hey, if we need to protect it, we need to protect it. But it has some serious consequences for where Pocono goes from here. And in light of those RPS directions to try and grow on existing settlements, connect to them, um, reinforce them and expand them, which I, I think does sit in some tension with, with the RL100 as a, effectively a green belt um, strategy. Um, so, so um, commissioners and Mr. Chair, as, as a way of trying to give you the quickest summary possible of what I've said, I think is one of the less contentious um, issues before you. I propose to wrap it up there. I'm happy to take your questions, of course. Thank you, Mr. Munro. Let's see if there are any questions for you. Um, Ms. Te Aho? No questions. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Gibb? Uh, no questions, but yes, interesting concept about the green belt, and we'll take that on board. Thank you. Um, Ms. Sedgwick? I have no questions, but I do note um, the uh, context of if and how, and thank you for that. Thank you. Mr. Fulton? Yeah, just a, <clears throat> a question on the um, um, 100, <clears throat> on the 100 metre line. The, if you allowed um, country living zone above that now, that then would actually restrict any further urban development up there, wouldn't it? So, you know, you'd, you, if, you, if, you, if that was allowed at the moment, that then would effectively make the line the, the top line, wouldn't it be for Pocono? No, I don't agree with that, sir. There, there are examples around the country of countryside living type densities in time being rezoned. And uh, the closest example I can think of to this part of the world is what's been zoned in Hungaya um, in, in South Auckland, which had a large area of um, countryside living type lots that have now been rezoned to full urban because that time has come. That doesn't mean it's the most straightforward <coughs> land to further intensify, but it can and does happen, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cooney. Isn't that, isn't that the problem we've got that uh, you're saying, well, uh, you can either draw the line and 100 L RL, and it's going to create demand pressure, or you can allow this, um, uh, this area to be developed into country living um, type development. Um, and then you're now saying, well, uh, yeah, in the future that can then be redeveloped into urban. So, so you're, you're defeating the whole purpose of that RL100 line, aren't you? I'm not a supporter of the RL100 line, sir. Um, but, but what I would say to you is I, I don't think it's an all or nothing debate of lock Pocono up forever or let it roll over every hilltop forever. The question is, what is the outcome you're seeking to achieve and what is the right way of doing it? The RL100 is a very, very coarse method and it's not a rural backdrop issue because it's only protecting a very small slice of the top of the rural backdrop. Let's be clear on that. A lot of what people think of the rural backdrop now would take in um, a lot of land well below RL100 because it's currently rural. And so the question might be, what are the particular amenity features that are worthy of long-term protection? Uh, and part of that is through restoration and enhancement. Part of that is through the slope that makes bits of land naturally undevelopable or less developable anyway. And so I suggest it might be more of a patchwork quilt that maintains a lot of these amenity features going forward. Um, as I say, I don't think it has to be cast as a hard line in the sand uh, one way or the other. In terms of creating, if it was to be brought uh, as, a, as a, um, a protection area in terms of uh, rural character backdrop, uh, from what I can gather from, a, from an earlier answer I got, uh, you're only talking 25, is it 25 houses we're talking? Certainly in terms of the area of land that I've looked at, the Pocono uh, West Limited Land today. Tomorrow I'll be appearing before you uh, related to the Havelock Village land, which is a, a little bit more affected by it. Uh, but certainly in terms of the land I'm looking at, it's not a particularly big imposition uh, one way or the other. That's right, sir. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Just one from me, Mr Munro, and you talked, to, and I think you made the, the point well in terms of saying if you can't build above the 100 metre ridge, you're effectively creating this green belt and stopping the westward sort of expansion of, of, of Pocono. I just wonder though whether 
there is still land across the other side of those ridges where expansion might be possible in the future so that we aren't effectively ring fencing Pukenau, where we are saying though that in the future there are still westward opportunities yeah. it's just yeah. that they face westward rather than eastward would, would i be right in assuming that you're absolutely right, sir. Um, my analysis to date is that that thinking, I, I didn't take it forward because I didn't see how that squared up with the current policy imperatives I'm reading from the RPS, which, which talks about more contiguous rather than patchwork and wholly and lumped out and, and disaggregated or disconnected. But, but you're right, sir. It could be possible to um, effectively fill the valleys and find some way of connecting across the ridge tops between them. Okay, uh, all right. No, I just wanted to... Be, I just wanted to... Yeah. fully understand what, yeah. what the situation was. So thank you for that. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Munro. I've got just, no further questions. Just, um, thank you, sir. Um, just Mr. Munro, could you just comment, just you mentioned Hingai, which is quite flat and was up zoned, but what about Point View Drive or Albany Hills, where countryside living or large lots may be acting as a bit of a buffer? Have you got any comment on that or? Look, I, I my position, sir, having seen a lot of development around the country change in a lot of circumstances, is that countryside living is not a reliable long-term growth boundary unless it is specifically purposed for that reason, usually involving consent notices or covenants. As soon as people on large lots get a chance to knock their mortgage off a bit by subdividing and putting a house on the back or putting three lots on the back, they do it. In fact, I'm, I'm looking at land I was involved in the planning of just 10 years ago in North Lake and Wanaka on the elevated hills leading to, around that edge of that town. And only five years ago, large lot sections were being um, subdivided. A large lot in Wanaka's urban terms are uh, effectively 4,000 square metres. And already they've been rezoned for future subdivision and all those landowners are into chopping it up. So, so I, I think that, that, that it's wrong to use a land use zone and assume it creates a long-term barrier that can't be changed in the future. People are really ingenious. Okay, that's very good. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks very much, yeah, Mr. Munro, that's helpful. Yeah, okay. thanks, bye everyone. Thank you. Which I think yes, so you to lunchtime. I think we're we're tracking pretty well progress wise. I think, Mr. Yeah. Paulus, I don't think there's any need to beat ourselves up. So I think we'll adjourn now until one o'clock and we'll see everybody back there. You will need to log off. Uh, there's a separate meeting request or separate link uh, for this afternoon session. So we'll see you all back at one o'clock, please. One, if one the panel wouldn't mind waiting for a moment, please. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair.